Well, hello. Well, hello. Well, hello. Ugh. Well, hello. I got to fix this. I really got to fix that. You, you got to fix it before the next the next one. I I know. You, oh, never, it... you never realize it until, <laughs> until you're live and I'm like, oh, I can't see my face. Welcome, everybody, to Pencil to Pencil, your favorite pandemic podcast. Uh, I am Jamar Nicholas, uh, eyes without a face, uh, uh, Philadelphia's favorite son and Grand Poobah of Comets. Uh, welcome again uh, to our uh, twice weekly podcast where we interview the hoi polloi of the creative and illustri- creative, illustrative, animative, all of those different functions. Of, all the itives. All the, all the isms. Um, and we are also brought to you by our good friends at Grand Graphicsly, who produce Clip Studio P. And also, to right over Mike's head is uh, the logo for Tomorrow's Publishing, who uh, the great people over at Tomorrow's bring you great pop culture product. Please go and support with your signal boosting and your dollars. <laughs> you got your matrix <laughs> hand going. Uh, I would like to do my best of introducing my co co host, uh, the bombastic Brett Blevins. Hey, hey, Brett. Hello. Brett, you have your drawing glove on tonight. Uh, I'm working. Yeah, look at yeah. that. Is, is, drawing. is that, uh, well, you know, when I used to see you with that, Brett, I thought it was kind of like a carpal tunnel thing, but that's kind of like your like your support glove for when you're drawing. Like Michael Jackson magic glove. <laughs> it goes back to when I was doing storyboards on paper, which is mm-hmm. a long time ago. And the, the uh, frames are about three inches long. And sometimes I had to draw an entire city in that frame, uh, down shot perhaps or something. Anyway, I was finding that my hand was getting sore on mm. the back. Not carpal tunnel, fortunately, but it was just almost just from overuse, I guess. So this thing is made for seamstresses. Wow. And it's got this super stretchy in all direction fabric that and then this you can tighten this up as much as you want. And it basically just massages your hand the whole time you're using it. Well, this, it's, it's called a seamstress glove or something. I, I don't. That's what it is. I don't know if there's a brand name. I have a bunch of them that I keep around. But, oh, so uh, you, so you have like a surplus of them. Yeah, I just order like five at a time. Oh, like, wow. eventually we're out. You can see this is going. You know, I can see I've got white, white out on my knuckle there. Um, but they wear. I just throw them in the washer every week or two. So, Brett, that's not one of those, because I know a lot of the younger cartoonists know about that Cintiq glove with the pinky. I, seen those. I have a Cintiq, obviously, and I use it all the time, but I I haven't, I sort of know of those, but I haven't seen anybody use one, so. Yeah. Is maybe My, a similar thing. Is that for to keep it from your hand from I, sticking to it, or? Yeah, I think it's just to keep your hand, like. From sticking, to, yeah, to stick yeah. to the. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be our new uh, our new greeting on pencil to pencil. That's your. <laughs> That's right. And next time I will clean this so it doesn't look so uh, covered with graphite. Then That's that right. would mean that you're a fake artist. It's well worn. That's right. I sometimes wonder that as I sit here and struggle after all these years. Oh my goodness! It's good to hear that, Brett, because I think you know what you guys are masters. You guys are modern masters. And to hear, like, you know, someone like yourself or Mike um, say, you know. See how dirty this eraser is? <laughs> Mistakes constantly. Mistakes are part of drawing. Well, on that note, say hello, Mike. My good friend, Mike Manley. How are you, sir? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm really good. Uh, I'm very excited because one of our best hermanos is, is in the green room. Um, and I want to bring him in soon. Uh, guys, if you have spent any time on the internet, you know that me and this guy are thick as thieves. And also, um, as I do with all of my friends, I'm super supportive of the careers. And it's such a joy to me to see uh, all my buddies excel and just elevate in the in the art form and also in their personal careers. So such a hater. <laughs> I'm like the anti-hater. I love that. That's, that's, that's right. That's right. Uh, so you know, we could I could do a really puffy like intro, but I'm just going to bring them on. <laughs> uh, everybody, uh, 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 did, puffy you know intro. 
<laughs> like, well, wait a minute. I just I just posted this article on my Facebook a little earlier, and it was from Marvel. I think it was like somebody wrote a piece about Mike Hawthorne ending his run on Deadpool. And they said that Mike Hawthorne is the most prolific Deadpool artist ever. And mm -hmm. like, you don't need to read the article. Like, that's enough right there. Like, I'm good with that. Uh, so, but, you know, since then, uh, Mike's going on to do a lot of other amazing things. And we'd like to catch up with him. So let's bring him in. Mike Hawthorne. <laughs> oh, hello. How are you? I didn't realize you guys were there. Sorry. Well, hello. <laughs> well, hello. I was just counting my Deadpool pages, <laughs> and I got tired. I need the glove. I like yeah. breath. Well, I do think, man. You need the glove. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that, How is are your, you guys? Your, uh, is your hair exclusively COVID growth, or did you have a start on it? Before? I, I I had a start. I've had I have had long hair for a couple years now. Quite a few. Uh, I actually cut it during during the uh, pandemic. Mm. Cut about I don't know that much off. My wife has this technique where she uh, braids it into sections and then chops off an equal amount, and then it because it's curly, you can't tell that it's not mm. a pro haircut. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think because in the the free the the twenty four hour comic book day that I did out at uh, PCAT, yeah, I don't remember your hair being that long. I probably had it up. I often have it up. I have it down today because I have a headache, and having it up makes it a little worse. Um, but yeah, I, I, if I'm at school, I generally have it up. I'm pretty sure. So you can have full ninja powers. I can. I absolutely can. It's funny because students have actually told, like, uh, it's gotten since Moana, it's gonna be this joke about. In fact, I think I have. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see it here. My mm. kids made me the the, the hook. When uh, the movie came out, and like <laughs> students will give me Moana toys, or rather uh, Maui toys, and so it's become a joke at the school. Ugh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. And actually, the funniest time was on a beach. I was uh, walking towards these kids, and um, I'd say maybe it was a, a little girl who's maybe four or five, and she had a little brother in a stroller. And she saw me walking up the beach and she's like staring at me like, holy crap. And I see her like without breaking eye contact, she starts to smack her little brother in the walker. And as I will go past, I hear like, it's Maui. Like, yeah. So it's part of my brand now, I guess. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's funny so. how people glom on to certain things about people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, I was talking to my kids actually about you the other day. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever uh, known Jamar without long hair. Like yeah. ever since we met, it's yeah. funny. Cause I was telling him, I don't think I've ever even seen a picture of you as a kid. Yeah. So I just imagine you were born with long hair. <laughs> I think I did. I think you did have a picture of you as a kid, but it was more close up on your face. Oh, you ready? I got you. Hold on one second. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. This is just for Hawthorne. I would never do this. <laughs> you're gonna see this. this you're gonna see this picture of this little blonde-haired kid. It's like, oh what? my god! <laughs> what? All right, you ready? I'm ready. And this will give you the origin of the hat too. You ready? <laughs> oh my what? god, that's fantastic! You gotta give that full. Yo, screen. that full needs screen. to be your album cover, like the uh, like <laughs> no, no. biggie one, man. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the that, same hat? What's that's like? Was that from like 2018? <laughs> <laughs> no. This is little baby Jamar. Look at that. Look, Look at that. Wow. Look how happy you are. Oh that, my yeah. God, man. What happened? Is it a blanket or is it some kind of creature? Uh, no, I'm holding a turtle. Turtle. So, so a real like turtle? A, no, it's a it's a stuffed animal. So. Oh, okay. Uh, for some reason, I've always been attracted to these hats. And on my 30th birthday, we were on a cruise, and I'm holding a turtle wearing a wearing a fisherman oh, hat. Oh, man. So when I get 60, I have to get another hat. You got another. Time. Yeah. Yeah, that 30. was. Yeah. We, I mean, I, I had many fisherman hats back in the day. That was the thing, man. <laughs> that was basically, if you couldn't afford a Kango, you rocked a fisherman hat. <laughs> Yeah, right. You know what That's I mean? Right. And I could never afford a Kango. <laughs> I wanted one so bad. It was my dream to be rich enough to afford a Kango and a pair of Gazelle glasses. <laughs> wow. I'm dead serious. It was like it was it was that and like the sheepskin coat. But my mom didn't want me to wear a sheepskin because she thought all the drug dealers wore those. 
Well, she which was is right. true, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, let's get it. Let's get into some uh, some brass tacks, everybody. Uh, Mike Hawthorne, who's a prolific um, uh, comic book artist and illustrator, um, who, uh, as I said in the intro, probably I don't. Mike, what would you think? What would you say you're the most known for publicly? Is it your Deadpool run? Yeah, probably Is it your Deadpool. Marvel run altogether. Is um, it? Yeah, I think people. Uh, it's funny. I think I don't exist to a lot of folks until I began at Marvel, uh, which is ironic because it's kind of late in my career. Mm -hmm. um, and Deadpool is definitely like the one that everybody knows me for. It's also odd to be known primarily as a superhero comic artist because like the first 10 years of my career, I never drew one. It was like, you know, Western uh, uh, action comedies, romantic comedies, everything but superhero stuff. But yeah, right now it's mostly uh, Deadpool and the runner-up is probably Superior Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, comics yeah. is kind of like that. I think they that comics is kind of like Hollywood. It's like the last thing you did is what you are. Yeah, yeah. And and it's funny because uh, I'm doing a lot of these. Uh, I mean, I guess they're technically fill-ins, right? But like they're kind of big books. So like the one just came out today for the Immortal Hulk, and uh, I'm doing another couple for another series. And I did uh, like I did a, a one issue thing with Thor and another one with like uh, uh, Tom DeFalco on on a uh, Midnight Records thing. And I've just been bouncing around, and it's funny. It's almost like you're you're. I just noticed people talking as if like, oh man, I wish they'd give you a series, as if like I'm not working or something. You know what I mean? Um, Mm -hmm. But usually when, when something went with my schedule, when I'm bouncing around on, like that, it's because there is a series in the works. We just can't jump on that and we can't tell everybody, hey, we're just biding our time till the next thing starts. So it, it is funny. It is definitely like you have, if you're not, if you're not on the stands every month, people start to sort of forget you, I guess. Yeah. I remember Tom Palmer told me once that, after about six months, comic books forget you. Oh. That if you don't do something in six months, it's like, oh, they, you know, they kind of. Yeah, that's sad. Kinda, yeah. I would know. think that's different now, though, right? Was he talking about the audience or the editors? The, well, I guess maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe both. I mean, um, I think that um, also things have, in the last 10 years, have really diversified more as we were talking in the last podcast than they did in the previous 10 years. I think everything was much more like, you know, you're doing a Scott Pilgrim thing or you're doing a Fantagraphics thing or you're doing a mainstream thing. And then even that was sort of like, if you were working at Vertigo, that's working at DC, but not at DC. True. Right. Yeah. Right. Although, right. although, you know, Vertigo was also like a tad bit more highbrow and, and, I know, you know, it, there's all kinds of weird perceptions within the industry, which you can't get around, but what can you do? You know, like, um, I just focus on the work and, and, uh, it is weird about like, if that, if there's kind of a period of time, I don't know that it's six months, but if there's a period of time where you don't have anything out, people assume you, uh, can't work or, or somehow, or like, uh, you've been relegated in some way, like. I remember when uh, Stuart Immelman uh, retired. <laughs> um, right. Um, he, you know, I remember people going like, "Wow, that's amazing!" Like, normally comics retire you, not vice versa, and you know, it's kind of a drag, I think, because um, I think we have a lot more. <sighs> we have a lot more say than I think some of the, the previous generations of comics artists have had. Mm -hmm. And it's it's sad that that perception's still sticking around because, um, you know, we can make moves now that can sort of mitigate some of that idea that like you're you're out of work. And so, you know, I, I could quit probably. I mean, I know guys that you know uh, look at someone like Chris Somney when he wasn't working at Marvel, and it looked like all he was doing was commissions for a long time. Mm -hmm. Number one. You could, he could live off of just commissions, which is which great, is amazing. yeah, yeah. Right. Like that, that's there's a certain amount of freedom to that. But number two, he was also essentially like he didn't have to take any book 
that came along. He had more options. And I'm like watching and I'm like, I know he has a series. There's a reason why you're not hearing stuff. It's because it's getting made. Um, and I think that's awesome. Like in like you guys, right? Like Mike, Jamar, all, Brett, like you guys are not just drawing for a living. You're making podcasts, you're doing a draw magazine, you're, you're, you're doing graphic novels, you're hiring yourself out for other stuff. Like we have a lot more advocacy than, than I think some fans may realize. So, and I think it's a good thing. Yeah, when, when I got in in the mid 80s, there was guys like uh, Don Heck and people from the previous generation who were definitely, or even like Kurt Swan, guys like that, who had drawn like a million comic books. He was yeah. like the Superman artist. Right. And then when John Byrne came along, it was sort of like, uh, you can draw masks now. And it was only some of the older editors who felt some personal fealty to some of those older guys like Gil Kane. Yeah. Uh, that they would give them. Like, I know Carlin, Mike Carlin gave Gil Kane fill-ins on Shazam when I was working on the book. And it was great. And he was still he was still good. But, yeah, right. I think, yeah, those guys came from a, an era where um, when – the long-term editorial staff <laughs> changed over their careers kind of went right south except for a few guys who remembered them right right and it's it, you know I, a good friend of mine uh actually you know what we had this discussion i think when we brought you out the pcad uh when and uh, uh bob mcleod was still there mm -hmm. and you know he would tell me about the old days like how and I, I, I hate to use that word because I don't think I think there's some ageism that like I don't I don't dig in comics. I think like anyway, it's a whole different subject. But he was explaining to me like how if you wanted to work back in his day, um, you had to basically be in the office outside of some editor's door waiting for someone to poke their head out and go, hey, I need 10 pages on such and such. And then, you know, three guys would raise their hand and he'd, they'd pick one of them. And um, I think there's a certain amount of, like, like the power dynamic is thrown off there. Like, you have to be good enough to get in the door, but you still have to wait for hopefully someone to choose you. And I think with all the options we have now, like, I don't have to sit around, you know, outside someone's door and hope that they call out for something. You know what I yeah, mean? Like I could decide, yeah. you know what, I'll just do a Kickstarter or I'll just do a webcomic or I'll just teach or I'll, you know, focus on Patreon or, or whatever. You even, yeah, you can even talk to the to the other creators, which in the beginning of my career, you, they didn't want you to talk to the writer. You had to talk to yeah. the editor and the yeah. editor had to talk to everybody else. And if you like uh, went around them and talked to somebody, that was kind of like, mm. Right, right. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, you got these email chains where like, you get to know all the writers and everybody that you're working with. So, you know, like inevitably, like you work with writers and if they get to like you to go, Hey, you know, we should do a creator own book. Right. Uh, so, you know, I got a half dozen, uh, you know, I don't want to say offers cause I can't quite get to them, but like things where people will say, Hey, we should do such and such book. And it's good to know that like they like your work enough to want to do that. And that's always another option. So um, it, it's, I'm not saying it's easy. I just think we have it easier than than previous generations. Well, of we have artists. options, yeah, right? We definitely, we have de definitely a lot yeah. of options. I yeah. mean, when Kirby left, when Kirby left Marvel, where else was he going to go but DC? Right, because he couldn't right. go out and start his own company. Right, you know, Wally Wood was like an early guy doing his own stuff, right? Yeah. From the May and Wits End and and trying to self publish. And that never the 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 market was not there in the way that it is now. Right. To sustain it, like even Gil Kane tried to do a Black Mark. You know, he tried to do his own thing. Yeah. And it was not easy. You had some guys doing the underground stuff, like the Zap comics and things yeah. like that. Richard Corbin, but I don't know what kind of living those guys made. Right. You know what I mean? Not probably the kind of living that if you were like a middle-aged guy with three kids going to college. Right. Right, and imagine someone like Herbie with with how prof, uh, uh, prolific he was with something like webtoons and Kickstarter at his disposal. Like he'd be, he'd do be doing like a half dozen web comics at once, 
right. and burning through them and probably a half dozen agents begging him to like rep them at you know, either Hollywood or literary magazine or uh, publishers and things like that. Like, yeah, it's it's a it's a shame. Like, uh, I would I there's a part of me that would love to see like what would someone like Gil Kane do if you had all these options that I have, and and I think it also makes me take them more seriously, right? Like, um, I I feel a little bit of like a debt of gratitude to these guys, and like, how can I not take advantage of all these avenues? Uh, that are like laid before me when when these other guys had to work so hard with so few roads to follow, you know? Yeah. Well, so so why don't you give us a little bit, like what Jamar was going to say earlier, give us a little bit of your, like, dissect your career a little bit because you had oh. the beginning where you were really doing indie stuff. You yeah. weren't really do, And you weren't necessarily aiming for majors, I don't feel, right? I really wasn't, uh, in fact. Yeah, I started out self-publishing a book called Hysteria that I was very, very convinced would be a humongous hit um, and did it like in the late 90s, like at the tail end of the glut where no one was was selling comics. But I was uh, I was a little too stupid to, to know that. Um, and I continued with Hysteria for probably... Uh, I mean, I self-published four issues, went out of business because Diamond wouldn't carry it anymore. In those days, like uh, that was the only distributor you had. And uh, if you didn't meet a certain benchmark, they wouldn't distribute you anymore. Right. So four issues in, uh, they had to drop me, which is cool. I, they, I was surprised I got that far. And I got it in my head that I would do a monthly independent book, which just meant I went out of business in four months instead of eight. I should have probably done it in <laughs> bi-monthly. Um, and I still have a fifth issue of Hysteria floating around here that never got published. Um, but went on to do a bunch of short Hysteria stories for like slave labor graphics. Although it's funny cause, um, I saw that mentioned on the comics beat once and, uh, the dude that runs slave labor was like, I literally don't remember publishing this. <laughs> 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 I had to like publicly go like, dude, it was in this comic, uh, it's called loving tights or something like uh so it just it was it was a uh, it was a bad time like people weren't paying attention to the stuff i was doing um but uh other creators did so i i, I had an ash can that i started with that i you know the old school like staple them together kind of thing which is how i met jamar i was dropping them off at comic shops in philly and i think jamar picked one up and emailed me to join the indie cred all-stars which is like this online community of comic creators that went on to like all of us. I mean, not all of us, but many of us went on to become pros and like Eisner award winners and everything. Uh, and I got my first big break from Matt Wagner on a Grendel short. Uh, and Grendel was, we, I actually met him uh, cause he was a Philly guy. He was at a convention and I, I, it was my first convention and a friend of mine and I put together a Grendel pitch and showed it to him. And uh, he's like, you know, I'm not going to publish your, your thing, but you ought to get some work. And he gave me my, my big break. So, which I'm super grateful. He's been, he's been a really good friend and champion for me. We had the same illustration professor, but like 15 years apart. Oh, okay. uh, so it was a weird connection. That was the only reason I even I had the nerve to approach him because I wasn't, I wasn't a con goer, uh, I just, I, in fact, I remember that specific con. I walked up, I showed him my stuff. I showed my stuff to Joe Quesada, which was a little surreal because like I work with him now. Um, and uh, a woman whose name escapes me. And I remember I went up to her and she looked me in the face and she says, you know, I can't help you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I, 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 it, I took it to mean that like no one, bothered unless they thought there was something in it for her for them mm. and i was like no i genuinely just need advice like i don't know what to do um mm. and that was it and i was like after that experience i didn't i didn't show stuff to people at cons again like um i i had been sending in submissions since i was like 16 and i didn't get work till i was like maybe 28 or something like i had been self-publishing just non-stop grinding and just didn't get gigs until matt uh, broke me in at uh, Dark Horse, and then you know it's one person sees that thing and they ask you to draw the next thing. Once, the, and, once you break, once you break the, yeah. the wall, yeah, right. And and My like God. you, go ahead. I'm sorry, I mean, no, 
Uh, but go for it. So this is a really, really interesting part of your timeline for me, because when we were doing the Indie Cred All-Star stuff, and we've talked about that at nauseum, so I think a lot of people know where we're coming from with that. <laughs> Yeah. One of the things that I think really stood out with you is that your work was so good well, so you, far man. back. It was kind of like, well, when is when is he going to go to the yeah. major? I, Not if, yeah, right? I remember feeling bad actually. Like a, a couple of creators on there would, would get on a board and think I remember a, a couple of guys literally saying they were gonna quit because they would say if Mike can't get work. Mm -hmm. then this industry is not open to any of us kind of thing. And, uh, and that was depressing. Like I, I really, I, I felt terrible about that. And, and uh, I was a little more hard headed and just thought for sure, it just takes time. I've always, like, I think uh, hysteria early on was influenced by like Seagar, uh, Seagar's Popeye and G.I. Joe. And I always give the example of um, there's an episode of, I, what's that? Manly's laughing at that. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I think Jamar knows this story, but like one of my favorite characters was Shipwreck on G.I. Joe, and there was an episode where like there's some kind of a monster that they can kill with uh, apples. Like the, what is it, arsenic that's in the seeds? Yeah, yeah. And they're like, if we just throw enough apples at this monster, we'll kill it. And there's a scene where like they have to literally drag Shipwreck off a tank because he keeps tossing apples at this monster. And that was like literally me for my entire big, like first third of my career was just, I, maybe it'll just take one more apple. Mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky enough to get some gigs. Like now early on, it was, you know, it weren't super lucrative or anything, but I was just happy to be working. Like it, it was, it was a big well, I deal. I think that's, a, that's an important um, lesson or example, because um, I think one of the, the, aspects of social media is that they show people the end but they don't show them the process yeah. you suddenly see this yeah. person like ta-da i'm yeah. successful i'm working here i'm yeah. doing all this stuff but they don't show people it's like the art of book you know you see the art of book and you go oh wow like everything in here is perfect but you don't see the ten thousand drawings they got yeah. rejected or the people that got kicked off the the thing right. or they said you weren't right for that right. Right. You know, I mean, I know when we when we uh, interviewed you on the last podcast, it was funny that it turned out that you and I both applied to work on the Ripping Friends that John K. Oh, God, that's right. Yeah. I right? actually went out to L.A. for that. Right. I just said I just faxed all my stuff. I didn't. Right. But you actually got on an airplane and yeah. went out there. Yeah, it was a different it was a different me. Like uh, in those days, like I, I mean, I was dead broke. And I get a call from the studio and they say, uh, John Kay says, um, if you're ever in LA, stop by the studio. And I'm like, okay, I will be there next week. I like scrounged every penny I had and just flew. And this is before like, you know, Ubers and, and everything. You know what I mean? Like I literally just put flew. two stamps on your head and put yourself in a yeah. box and like, I mean, seriously, package like the bugs money. <laughs> yeah. I remember we literally, we flew into San Diego cause it was cheaper. A buddy of mine came wow. with me. Wow. So then you and, had to drive from. Right. Because I thought that made sense. I was like, ah, it's like driving, to, you know, like if I fly to Philly and then drive to New York or something. And it was a nightmare. I was like, Jesus, what the hell did we get into? But, and then we didn't know. We just drove to the neighborhood and then drove, found the studio and then drove around till we found a hotel. Like it was no pre planning whatsoever. <laughs> um, and it, it didn't go well. And I remember I did get a job offer through him. Um, I don't know if I should tell the story, but basically I just sure, made yeah. him, I made him like really, <laughs> it's a long story, but like, basically I kept saying, I kept calling them and saying, look, I'm going to be out on this date. Is John K going to be there? Cause I know occasionally he would travel and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll be here for sure. I'm like, are you sure? Cause I can only be there from this date to this date. It was about a week. Um, and I want to make sure I meet with them. And of course, when I get there, he's not there. And I got very uh, aggravated <laughs> and he was going to be back the day I was leaving. Ah. So I, uh, I, I'll never forget. Like we, you know, spent the, the week in LA or whatever. And I drove in, I had just enough time to go in and meet with him and then dr drive back to the airport. 
And uh, I get into the car to go meet with him in like DMX's, uh, uh, y'all gonna make me lose my mind. You remember that? <laughs> Cause I'm like, oh, I'm gonna beat this dude's ass if he's not there. I don't know how that worked, but the, I was just so angry. And I remember going and I see this middle-aged guy walking away from the studio with a, a girl way too young for him. And I'm like, I bet that's him. Like, I don't know. But I bet that's him. You saw the, the Reed Richard sideburns. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I, 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 it took all my power to like not like grab him and say, like, are you John Kay? And if you are, where the F are you going? <laughs> um, so I go to the studio and they're like, oh, you just missed him. I'm like, well, guess what? I'm not leaving till he gets back. Mm. And so they, I, I don't know how they got in touch with him. He comes back, he takes me to the, the back room, looks at my portfolio. Says like, oh, this stuff is cool. You should change this and this and that. It was nice meeting you. And I remember I jumped up out of my seat and I stood in front of the door and I'm like, I didn't come all the way from Pennsylvania for a crit. Like I came here because you guys offered a job and was told that if I'm in a studio, if I'm in LA to come by the studio, I'm in LA. Like where's the job? <laughs> and uh, and and then it it after the fact I realized I made him very uncomfortable. Cause like he didn't know if I was a psycho. And um, so he sits back down he goes, well, um, no, this is before he sat down. And he says, well, we can only hire people from Canada cause the production's right. there. And then I really was about to lose it. Cause I'm like, why the F did you bring me out here? <laughs> so right. I said, look, then I'll move to, I'll move to Canada. And uh, he's like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. I'm like, well, then we need to figure this out. And he goes, well, uh, 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 let me let me talk to my business manager, see what we can do, see if we can get you a a, a position in the story department. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I, I remember I let him let him out the room basically. Um, <laughs> and then I, I got back in the car and started to drive back, and I realized like, wow, I let my I let the old me like take over a little bit too much, and got back home. And my wife was pregnant with my first kid, so I was like extra like crazy and desperate like don't like it's a job offer you don't play with that kind of thing and uh, i remember they called and said about you know coming out and i i, had, I was like i turned them down because i'm like I, I it was a bad vibe like it was it was the whole thing just was very negative and i was like i can't drag my wife out there uh mm -hmm. on, and, and, and it make just her was, an accessory to murder <laughs> <laughs> um, and it worked out. It worked out for the best. It, you know, that the studio shut down. The show got canceled. He turned out not to be so good of a dude. Yeah. You know, he got me too. Um, and and so I'm. I, I just I've always gone with my gut, and it always ends up costing me jobs or money. But it's always worked out. You know, like uh, so. I'm, I'm. It's a long story, but the point is, is like I would I would be. Uh, I was probably too forceful with what I wanted there. But I've always been very like upfront with clients, like. This is what I need. I will make everything you need happen as long as we, like, the, the exchange is understood up front, you know? So, well, uh, I, th I think that that, I think that, that uh, what you did was not uh, unconscionable because, I mean, the fact that he basically, it, one of the things about the beginning of your career is there's all these verbal agreements. Hey, I like your work. Yeah. Hey, maybe I have something for you. Yeah. I said yeah. that to 50 people at this convention. And then yeah. you write that person later on and like, uh, wh what? Yeah. Is that yeah. sort of convention speak that people give Yeah, when you're at a show and you shine people on? Right. And then later on you go, well, you know, you maybe gone like you did. You went, you actually went, I just faxed like a, a shit ton of stuff to them. Right. Right. Because right. I'm not going to go to LA unless. Well, you were, you were smarter than me. <laughs> well. But what I'm saying is that you were aggressive enough to follow through. Yeah. Well, because he upon... had someone call me. Right. I guess that was the reason why I justified how I behaved. Because it was like, it, it wasn't just a case where you said, hey, I like your work. We ought to do something sometime. Like he had his assistant call me and say, if you're in LA, come by the studio. And the way I grew up, it, that like meant you don't like lead someone on with, with work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so it was a big deal for me. But it worked out for the best, frankly. Mike, I have a question. This is just me to you. 
and to the rest of the guys. I think there's something that a lot of fans don't understand about the business aspect of moving further in your career, right? right. Where, you know, like one thing that I've always uh, adored about you is that you always lead with your gut and yeah. you're not afraid to say no and walk away from things. And I remember yeah. we used to have conversations, and I know it tears you up after the fact. Yeah, I mean, I've, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like, I remember this is like back when we were young bucks, and you would say things like, now I can't really get into it, you know, but I just had to say no, I had to walk away from them onion heads. And I'm just yeah. like, yo, you can do that? Yeah, no, yeah. It, it, I'm grateful. I mean, it has, I don't really regret saying no to the, the like, you know, I was offered a position at Valve, which was, at the time, a really big deal. And they were headhunting me for like a dream job. It was like, there was, it wasn't a position. They just wanted me in the studio making stuff, which if you learn about the industry, that's a dream come true, right? Like they're not saying, hey, come into the story department, even though we know you can do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, I went out to visit and I was just, I just can't, I didn't like Seattle. And I just, so I can put a dollar amount on all my failures, like all the things I've turned down. <laughs> um, like I did storyboards for a video game, like concept boards before it came out. And like, I had already committed to a comics project. So I could, I, I gave them about a month. I think it was, and we're like, well, why don't you come down to the studio? And I'm like, I'm not coming to you. I'll do your boards, but it's going to have to be remotely. And they were like, okay, fine. And, and, uh, I did these boards and I remember thinking like, you guys are crazy. Like you're giving your game away. You're going to be out of business, but that's cool. As long as my check's clear. <laughs> <laughs> and that game went on to be Fortnite. You know, like I've had, I've had all these like near misses. Um, but the thing I've always said, and I said this to the guy Valve, uh, what's his name? Gabe Noel, who was a Microsoft guy. He's uber wealthy. He's a big deal. And uh, I told him like, you guys are, and if you're trying to talk me into coming out the Valve, and one of the guys said there, not not gay, but his one of his guys says like, we'll, we'll double your pay. And I'm like, you don't even know what I make. Um, and what I told him was like, you guys are competing with happy. Like I'm already happy, so you have to offer me happy plus. And I don't know what that is. Um, so until I, I, I can see it, like it's sort of our decision making because the, I know that if I uproot everybody, it messes everybody's life up. So if it's not uh, hell yeah, then it's usually a no, if that makes sense. Like it has to be, I have to be really, really, really into it or the money's not worth it, even if it's a big thing. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you so, ever been moved for a job with your family? Never. Yeah, I never moved. I, I've had offers. Um, and whenever we would, you know, it would come up like with Valve and, and, and Epic with, with, uh, Fortnite and a couple of movies and uh whenever it's happened i you know none of it has ever been able to outweigh picking the kids up moving them taking them to a whole nother state or another side of the country um and and you know with certain offers it's been like i won't even get past go like i got offered when i was doing conan some german video game company wanted me to be a, like a lead character designer and i wouldn't even entertain it because i'm like I, there's no chance i'm going to germany um, so it, because of having kids, my, cause like literally like I've never had a career and, uh, no kids at the same time. Like I've always yeah. had children. So, um, I've always had the way moves against the disruption that it would be on their lives and none of them have ever been worth it. And, and I've had friends that tell me like, that's crazy. Like, why wouldn't you want to work in the video game industry or whatever? Um, and it's to me, it's kind of an easy decision if it meant the kids had to like have kind of a crummy childhood with me bouncing around a lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, have a, I have a question from the room. Oh, okay. Uh, and I know who this is from our Patreon exclusive. Oh, is it Mike? Yeah. Ah, that's my boy. From uh, our it, it Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Thorne and I do. Uh, Mike Thompson is the king of questions, so he's he's a smart thanks, guy too. Thanks join thanks for joining us, Mike. Mike says I've read John Buscema preferred working on titles like Conan versus traditional superhero titles. 
to everyone. This is to all three of you. Right, maybe right. Me. In an ideal world, do you have a preference? What gives you the most joy? Thanks, Mike. Good question. Huh. What do you guys think? Hmm. That's I, you know, I, I feel like I, I know what like Jamar and Mike would say, but I'm, I, I'm not sure what Brad would say, actually. I think uh, what intrigues me is whatever the problems are to be solved. So I don't know that I would ahead of time say I, I would never want to draw so-and-so or I'd never want to do this. It depends entirely on the nature of what the project is. And actually, years ago, I don't do this much anymore, but years ago I thought, well, if I'm going to get better, I have to learn how to draw anything that may come along. Right. I actually used to take projects based on the fact that I had no interest in them. Oh, Lord. So I figured that by the end of this, I'll have learned how to draw right. horses or the inside of a submarine or whatever it was. You know? Right. Because once it's in front of you, then it becomes a creative process of solving problems, which is the thing that keeps me sitting here. You know, I, I yeah. So right on. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. What about you, Mike? I, I think it was it's probably different now than it was when it started. Because when you start, you just want you just want a regular job, regular book, regular gig. Yeah. Um and you know, to my mind, uh, somebody like Buscema or Bill Kane was sort of like my idea of what a professional was. Mm -hmm. And so you would try to get a book and, you know, maybe you would, I would prefer to work on something like the Fantastic Four, right? Or something would be a lot of fun to draw. But sometimes you don't get that, but you want to continue to, to eat. So you take, you take different projects. Now I'm at the point where, you know, I can more easily separate something that I do for money Right. And something that I would do for, because I, I wanted that. And I think if now it's probably the, the idea of doing what I thought would, I would have liked when I was say 23, which is how old I was when I was started. I don't know if I'll ever do the fantastic four, but I don't have to because I could do my own thing, right. which would be just as much fun. And I think I could only say that at this stage, I think it would be really hard to say that in the beginning yeah. because you, you, you're, you're trying to get regular work. You, you know, my idea of what a professional is almost does not exist. Right. Cause my right. idea of a professional was like 1970 right. and all the great guys I admired were all working at the same time. Right. And why they did it and how they did it and the politics of how they did it doesn't really exist now. So, uh, I think I'm more able to do stuff like the strips, uh, and I especially enjoy the Phantom because I I, lo I love classic comic strips. Um, but I don't try to I can I can enjoy that process without having to pour everything into it. Right. I can pour everything else into my wind down drawings or my sketchbook stuff, right. my personal projects that I'm developing. And I can do that now where I think it was much harder to sort of like rein the horse in when I was younger. You want to put everything into everything and you're right. all totally emotionally invested in it. So, right. and I think with Basema, he never really liked superheroes. <laughs> and guys from that generation, Al didn't love superheroes. Williamson yeah. didn't love superheroes. Right, right. You know, a lot of those guys didn't. They liked adventure strips. Yeah. So it's probably more fun for him to just draw a guy because he loves figures fighting with swords and, uh, you know, hot damsels in distress. And he doesn't have to draw, like, the inside of the shield helicarrier, which I'm right. sure he probably, like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> talks, you know, he would sort of make fun of the, the character. On that way. He had some stats of old pages from the, the Silver Surfer. And I guess they were his pencils, but they um, – you could see under the panels, you'd have the this fantastic Michelangelo-looking drawing of the surfer just agonizing over something. And at the bottom, he would write, the wimp cries. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, that's, man. That's what Stan would get. That would be the notes that he would get the script from. And that's it was awesome. Pretty contemptuous of the subject matter most of the time. Wow. What about you, Jamar? <sighs> well, I think for me, it's a little... Like I'll say it's different in the sense that 
I'm surrounded by all of you guys that do such amazing superhero stuff. And I've never really leaned into superhero stuff myself, right? I didn't come up in that space. I'm a comic strip dude, right? right. I came up in the newspapers. So, and just what I've been doing lately and for the past decade or so, I would be more interested in doing like emotional uh, connect connective tissue type of projects right? Ver versus ghostwriter. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like that yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That doesn't scratch any itches to me, and I would just in my head go, "There's like I can name ten dudes off the top of my head that could rock this project," and I'm like <laughs> struggling with it. You know what I mean? So I would find you know my joy in something a little more grounded. If that gotcha. makes sense. You know, yeah, I, um, I never even wanted to do comics. I, I I sort of fell in love with them after I started doing them. Wow, and really? It was odd because I when I was a kid, I just loved drawing of all types. And, I painted, and I had discovered the Frazetta paperback covers. My uncle gave me a set of those early Ace ones. So I, for a long time, I didn't know he did comics. Mm. Um, wow. But I just was in love with single images. But at the time, I was living in a rural Georgia, and I, my uncle would take me to conventions occasionally, which was great. And I got the idea that I could send samples to these people through the mail. I had no idea how you would do book covers. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's what I did. I started sending stuff in when I was 13. Wow. Uh, with Al Milgram. Every few months he'd write me back and say, you need to work on this. And Wow. You know, hand only has five fingers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so finally I got a job, you know, about seven years later. So it seemed to me like I'd been at it forever by that time. But I was only 20. Wow. I thought it, it, I'd been at it forever. And, and I had, as Mike was saying, the business was different then. So for me... The idea was, is if I'm drawing today, I'm winning. Yeah. No matter what the job was. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel you with that one. Mm -hmm. I think you're still winning if you're drawing for a living. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, having worked in factories and all that kind of stuff, it, yeah. this is definitely, it definitely beats that. Um, but to get to Mike's question, I know, like, uh, I was a little, like, Brett in that early on, and, and 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 like Mike in that like, uh, I avoided superhero stuff because I thought that was the smart thing to do because I wanted to be able to draw like all these guys I I admired did everything right and from you know adventure romantic sci-fi western whatever and I thought that's what the job meant was like being able to draw anything at the drop right. of a hat so. Um, I purposely would take jobs like like Brett, not so much with uh, things I didn't have interest in, but things that I thought I would learn something from. And so I did all this stuff except superhero stuff. And I wouldn't, I wasn't sending in submissions for superhero stuff. Um, the thing that sort of turned the corner and I think made me a superhero comic artist really was Deadpool. And that series was unique because um, I, I broke a lot of personal rules because that series broke a lot of rules for me. So um, so like I said, I would never be an exclusive. And I would never stay on a uh, series for more than 12 issues because I used to get bored. And um, once I started working on Deadpool, uh, that, that one series became all these different things. So we would do uh, you know, an arc that was, uh, had some Western elements and then an arc that was in space and then an arc uh, where it was very emotional or, uh, you know, like kind of a personal like one-on-one -on -one, as opposed to like big bombastic fight scenes. And, um, and then you have another issue that was like a Mission Impossible kind of movie. And that one series, and I, I got the love and work with Jerry and everybody so much that that one series started to fulfill like all these different genres for me that I wanted to learn and get good at. Um, so, you know, one issue I'd be drawing a car chase scene and the next issue was like an action scene in the danger room where it might be any outlandish crazy thing. Um, and so I ended up sticking on, you know, for way longer than I had planned and signing an exclusive with Marvel just because I thought like, I don't want to leave anyway, so I might as well take the extra money of being an exclusive. Um, 
And uh, I think that's why people react so strongly to that series for us is because it was sort of making superheroes uh, fun for me. And it, I think it was showing up on the page. And uh, I remember taking my kids to go see The Incredibles and uh, watching my kids like run around trying to be like, uh, what was it, Chase or what was the, the little fast Dash, 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 Dash that's Dash, it. Yeah. And uh, I realized like, oh, that's why people love superheroes so much, right? Because they get that moment and they're so enamored with it and they want to recreate it every time they pick up a comic. And I'm reading, uh, I'm reading these scripts and I'm like, these are great little nuggets of just fun superhero stuff. Yes, it's Deadpool and people sort of think of, they get what he's about and it's all like fart jokes. Um, but Jerry really didn't write them like that. It really was this whole like uh, Pagliacci kind of like crying, you know, uh, laughing clown, but crying on the inside kind of thing. Um, and it so to sort of combine the question with where I ended up with Deadpool, it, it allowed me to learn how to draw just about everything that you could if you if I was still bouncing around between genres. Mm. Mm. Um, Mike, I have another question from the room. Okay. And this is kind of, this is a Marvel 1.0 Hawthorne question. Uh oh, okay. Because I think a lot of your fans don't know that you had a, you had a bout with Marvel. Yeah, yeah, 2005. The, yeah. Right. So uh, Vera, thanks Vera, says, so Hawthorne, would you ever like to work on a machine teen comic again? Yeah. So maybe Mike, talk about your first kind of Marvel time. Yeah. So my very first Marvel. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, you do. Yeah. So my very first Marvel gig was kind of a unique situation. I didn't realize it at the time, but um, we were going to be creating an entirely new character. I mean, it was based on a play on words of with Machine Man, but. Uh, it didn't bear any resemblance to it. So it was a weird experience. Like I didn't realize um, that it was it was unusual to like your first gig to also be creating a new Marvel character. And it's sort of um, become a theme with my work at Marvel. Like at this point, we've I've either co-created or redesigned like dozens and dozens and dozens of characters. Um, so I, I just enjoy that. And that was a cool experience, like getting to start from scratch with a character. I kind of wish we could have gone more nuts with him. Um, but the market was funny and they kept cutting it back. Like, I think we were going to do two arcs and then I got cut back to like eight issues. And then that got cut to four issues just because of what was happening at the, in the market at the time. Um, so I, I, it's funny because they would use Machine Teen after I, they ended the series, and it was cool to see him pop up. And I, I would uh, joke with Jerry that we should bring him into the Deadpool universe, mm -hmm. um, which he didn't quite do. But like there was a uh, he would Deadpool would put together a team every so often with the Heroes for Hire thing. Uh, Mercs for money, sorry. Um, and one of the one of the versions had uh, the more recent machine man you know so we didn't quite work him into the series but it would be fun because i mean that it's a cool character um I, I think i don't know that i would want to do like a purely machine team series unless like uh we could make it really really outrageous i wouldn't want to just like revisit it i would want it to be like just bonkers and fun uh but it would be cool to just have like him visit a series i'm working on maybe so and you, yeah, and you also worked on Conan during that time, didn't you? Was that yeah? Was I, that did a, I did a I did a year. Yeah, I did a year of Conan when it was still at Dark Horse with uh, Dark Roy Horse Thomas. Yeah, uh, which was cool. You know, like getting. I've had this great luck to sort of be a bridge where, like, uh, I'm I'm just old enough to get to work with some of these like legendary dudes, right? So I got to do a GI Joe story with Larry Hama. I got to do a year. Of, uh, of Conan with Roy Thomas, um, you know, I, 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 it, and that was, it was a huge learning experience too. Cause like, um, I didn't realize it was a unique skill in comics to still be able to work from a Marvel script, meaning like just a paragraph per page with no panel breakdowns or anything. So um, I think coming into comics, having done all of it, like with hysteria and in these stuff, like, you know, you have to write your own stories and draw them and letter them uh, it it seemed 
pretty easy to work from a Marvel script. So I get to work with these legendary dudes. And I still do. Like I got to do um, a Thor story with Simonson. And it was inked by uh, 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 Sal Buscema, of mm -hmm. all people, which is incredible. And uh, But yeah, Conan for a year. It was, it was, it was a little nerve-wracking, too, because Conan has such a deep and, and like, amazing history of artists. And I remember thinking, like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> but, yeah, it was fun. It was cool. Did you have to cast your Conan? I did, and, and I remember getting him really, really wrong in the beginning because I thought they said, well, it's going to be a slightly younger Conan, and I let my imagination go oh, get away with me usually when I'm starting new projects, and I'm like, what if we made him a teenager? And I went like I did these designs where it was like this uh, like kind of gangly, teenager-y looking Conan, kind of like Hercules from the old Disney movie, the teenager version, mm. uh, and, and I gave him like – I made him like very – like his hair was bonkers and it was, and they were like very polite. And they were like, Mike, you're acting crazy. <laughs> Let's <laughs> it down a little bit. Is Conan's I, voice cracking? <laughs> my crumb. <laughs> but yeah, I had to, I mean, I, I tend to, um, I tend to redesign everything I end up jumping onto. Uh, and, and it actually bugged some of the Conan fans at the time because they felt like, what is this version? Like, why does he look like this? Why is he a little different? And, um, you know, now looking back on it, like, I think probably it's, it doesn't look so outrageous, but for some reason, when I came on the redesign, I did really like made people nuts or not all people, but like hardcore Conan fans were going nuts. Like on the, uh, message board for, uh, mm. uh, uh, for Conan, like they would just, some friend of mine directed it to me and I should have never looked. They were like going oh, yeah. nuts. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there was probably a, a, uh, I mean, there was a big change just when you went from Barry Smith to John Buscema. Right. Right. And I thought it would be normal. I thought like, well, people understand that like, there's not a hardcore description of the guy in the book. Um, you know, just, he's supposed to be big and, kind of marry and he and he and he's a barbarian and there's there's no physical i shouldn't say no but there's very little physical description of the guy mm. so i thought like well i mean my take wasn't so crazy i thought it made sense and the dark horse people thought it made sense and roy seemed to enjoy it um but you know and okay. then yeah no problem um and i got to design a villain which you know i, I just designed it essentially how roy described it I remember the fans went nuts. They were like, this is outrageous. What kind of crazy? Because he had like a hand for a sword. I'm sorry, a sword for a hand rather. And he was had like one fake eye. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I, draw, I just drew what he told me. But somehow like I think they thought that I made all that stuff up. And I was like, I got to be kind of a villain. And then I didn't play nice with him. Like I, if I'd have gone on a message board and been, hey, fellas, how are you? I'm sure it would have probably went over. But I, I just thought the hell with this. Like. I'm gonna do the thing they hired me to do and do my best. And if people don't like it, then write the editor, I guess, and get me fired. But yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, I don't. I can only imagine if there had been a message board, probably, you know, when they switched from from uh, 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 Barry Smith to Basema. Yeah. There probably would have been people saying, "What the hell? This is crap!" You right. know, blah 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 blah. I'm sure right. if the if that had existed back in the day. I mean, the first what two thirds of my career, there was no internet. Yeah, yeah. So there was nobody jumping right down on you as soon as you right did something. And now I I think young people, younger artists coming in, like right from the very beginning, man. Yeah, people are like just because I mean, what's the same for you when you started out and you were doing your your stuff? You would get feedback. If people wrote you a letter, but people were not piling on you on a message board right well i mean well we there was i mean i never had a, a point in my career where i didn't have the internet in fact that's how jamar and i met right we okay. were on this indie cred all stars was like a, a a forum um so i was lucky in that early on i always got a lot of positive feedback from people um and it probably wasn't the best thing for me early on because i i noticed that i would like become uh, almost depend like that constant, like I could post a drawing or a comic and then immediately people tell you how great you are. And I started to notice that I was like, 
uh, working for that. And um, I had never had that growing up, like people telling you like how great you are. So I, um, I noticed that it wasn't the most healthy thing for me, not because I was getting negative feedback, but just because of that, like, it was like a cookie and I was constantly like, oh, I need that cookie nonstop. Yeah. Yeah, that um, valid, the constant validation. Yeah, so it 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 was in you know I I wonder what my career would have been like if I had a period of time to where there wasn't an internet and that that feedback loop you get you know, right. But I mean I'm grateful because people were always nice. Um, it wasn't until later that you know people started to get a little more aggressive, and by that that point like. Uh, I just didn't care. Like I was hard and I was hard headed enough. I shouldn't say I didn't care, but I was hard headed enough that I felt like as long as I'm doing my job, you may not like it, but at least I know I'm trying my absolute best. Now, if I'd have been, you know, hacking it out, I'd have, I probably would have been a little more crushed, <laughs> but you know, um, what can you do? Like, if you know you're doing your best and people still don't dig it, then it's just a taste thing. What can you do? It's you also know? whether you respect the person's opinion. Yeah, I, I would try to be respectful of, of fans' opinions because most of them, like I'd be lying if I said I was like a big Conan fan before being hired for the series. Um, so I would try to be respectful that they knew more about the character than I did. But that doesn't mean that I can allow them to like knock you off this, the, the, the tracks right. because of their opinions. Like you, the book still has to come out. And if I start getting, you know, too caught up in like all the input, um, it, I would have, I would just would have crumpled up and not finished the book ever. So, and I think that that that's what when I said early on, where I was getting a lot of positive feedback, and I realized I was coming becoming dependent on it, and I made a conscious decision to sort of pull back from it, because um, I would either like try to talk people out of complimenting me, or uh, it just, yeah, I, but at the same time, kind of wanting it. And I realized it's just not a healthy way to be. So I had to sort of teach myself to not argue with people about it, just say thank you and move on and be grateful without needing that that loop nonstop, right. you know? So, yeah. So, other- so did you, when you were casting your Conan, did you think of a certain actor? Because I do that all the time. I always think of an actor. And I'll, yeah. the great thing now about Google is if you, if you, you know, just say you said, uh, I don't know, Jack Palance or somebody. Right. You can find right. like a, a zillion pictures of that person. Yeah. Yeah. I don't helps. do that so much. I, I, I guess I just sort of, uh, I, I probably should. That might help a little. Um, I tend to just start sketching and, and letting ideas come out and waiting till something uh, speaks to me and then going, okay, that's the one. And then fleshing that one out. Um, which means you end up having, you know, half dozen sketches that are not working at all, uh, like the teenage version. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, I tend to need to make, to take the thing too far and then realize, okay, that's the line that I can't cross. And I can, you know, go one or two steps back and have it be really close to what I want it to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> Mike, there's a, a, a sidebar question. Okay. Uh, our good friend, J. Robert Deans, hey, JRD. Hello. Asks, I always loved Mr. Hawthorne's works as part of comic twart. Maybe you can talk about that. Yeah. But I really enjoyed Raising Crazy. Will he ever revisit the strips when his son reaches a milestone age? That's Thanks. funny. And maybe uh, you can talk about that for a second. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, comic twart was sort of my second... If, if Indie Cred All Stars was like my BFA, Comic Twart was probably my MFA in comics. Uh, it was just a group of us. The, the guys had started it actually before me on Twitter, and they would just all decide a character. I think they made, they made uh, uh, like two character assignments. So they would say, you know, we're going to draw, all draw our version of Thor. And, uh, I think two weeks went past with that. I think they did Ronin and Thor uh, before they were like, hey, you know, we should make this official and have a little circle of guys we all like. Um, and so they invited me to come in and it was it was basically like a weekly assignment. And my knowledge of comics wasn't like so deep that I knew a lot of the characters. So to me, it was like, 
although it was kind of a weekly assignment that was unpaid, it was the one I most looked forward to because like I would experiment with medium or approach and it was characters I'd never heard of sometimes like uh, that I had to try to figure out for that week. And it was just, it brought me back to when, you know, you're a little kid and sitting in a room with all your friends and drawing cool stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we would all post it and um, it got to be way more popular than, than any of us expected. And uh, we just kept up with it until, you know, what ended up happening, like with most pros, like you get too busy and then you miss a week and then you miss a second week. And um, yeah. it was kind of a drag. I mean, it went out, it went on for a couple of years. I, I, I kept posting probably a little longer than, than some of the other guys, just cause I was, you know, I, I was very hopeful that we could keep it going. Um, just cause I, I felt like it was a, a, a free education, right? Like I was, seeing my take and then how all these other guys are doing it. And we talk about how they did it. And it was just, it was a cool way to experiment with styles. Um, and then raising crazy was, uh, when my son was born, he was, uh, so I had two girls before him and they're, they're like unusually intelligent. Like my oldest speaks, uh, besides English, obviously, um, Greek, Chinese and a little Spanish. She's actually in college now studying to be an engineer. Wow. Mm. Um, you know, my middle daughter is again, she speaks, uh, she studied Greek for five, six years and uh, working on Spanish now. And then my son came along and he was like a little caveman and I didn't know how to deal with him. Like I could rationalize things with my daughters and you couldn't with him. <clears throat> and he was tons of fun, but he was like, you know, he would just do crazy stuff all the time. And I don't know how to uh, deal with anything other than through drawing. So it was just like, this kid's too funny and he's doing crazy stuff that's stressing me out. I need to like have an outlet for it. So I started doing these like one panel comic strips. Um, and I love those. Uh, again, I only stopped doing them. It was a couple things. Uh, one was um, he started, he was, he was taking them the wrong way. Like he started to believe he was a celebrity when he was a little kid. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was weird. Like, cause the, the strip, I want, I don't want to say it got popular, but like it resonated with people. And we got an interview with like a, a, a Pennsylvania magazine and we were on the cover and he thought he was famous then. Um, I remember him going into a store and getting offended that there was a Justin Bieber doll, but not a doll of him. <laughs> uh, it was hysterical. And, um, how old was he? Oh man. Uh, I started raising crazy. I started with just a Twitter feed when he was probably like two or three and the comic strip maybe began, I, I want to say it was like four or five. Um, and, and maybe went on until he was six or seven or something. Um, and he was just a funny little dude. And, and, and somebody approached me about a, uh, like a, a reality show. Uh, there's a couple of those like in our area. And I just thought like, this is weird. And, and I turned that down and um, just sort of, it served its purpose. Like I sort of did it so I could learn to sort of document uh, these crazy things that he was doing and making sure that like, I don't know what I was hundred percent looking for out of it, but it allowed me to sort of put it, the ideas on paper, I guess the way most people would journal things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it helped me sort of document this, the funny stuff he was doing so that when he would stress us all out with some crazy antics, you know, I could look at these strips and go like, you know what, with some time, these are hysterical. Comedy uh, gold. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did pitch them to an agent about, uh, you know, like to sort of take it to a more like literary publisher. Uh, and he, there wasn't really any interest in it. And I was just the one agent. Um, he is now 14 and he's still, really hysterically funny like uh, my uh my middle daughter is a is a high school senior and we have to do all the whole all the senior stuff like she's got her picture ready and she has to come up with a senior quote and she's using something he said for her senior quote and I, i'm gonna get this wrong but he said to her like you can't can't not if you can't not can't or something and we were like, what the hell does that mean? And so like my daughter, my oldest being the math whiz, like basically wrote it out into an equation. 
<laughs> and we figured it out. And, uh, and it meant like, you can't do what you can't do. It was like, the, and, and this is perfect for him um, because he is wacky and ends up saying like super insightful because he's kind of a sensitive kid, but you don't realize it because he's so funny that you, the, 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 the smart thing he's saying is always wrapped in a joke. And I remember I, I took the, this was literally yesterday. I took the equation. I'm like, this can be simplified even more. And I did the, you know, like wrote a line underneath and I wrote, uh, it is what it is. And he just wrote this funny, like he said this funny ass thing essentially to say like, it is what it is. You got to accept certain things. And I keep telling myself like, damn, like even now, I, I, I wish I was still documenting this stuff into a comic strip because the guy is, He's a unique dude. He actually, he's drawing quite a bit, um, which I tried to discourage him from doing, but he's insisting on doing it anyway. You can't discourage somebody who wants to do it. I know, I know, I know. Um, yeah. But uh, you, You're going to be like, uh, was it supposedly Joe Cuber did that and John Romita Sr. did that, tried to discourage yeah. their kid from them. They, they, they did it. Anyway, yeah, right. yeah, I, I, I did it once to my middle daughter. It was, I was a joke. She was like leaving for school or something, and um, uh, she said something to me, and I was like, you know, uh, when you guys, when you guys leave, dad just has to go up to a studio, draw all day, and cry, and I just meant it as a <laughs> joke, and she took it to heart because she wanted to, to, she was like, I want to be an artist like you, and then she starts telling us how she wants to be a, a dental assistant or something. It was like the saddest, not that there's any shame in that job, but it was the saddest like drop from I want to be an artist to I want to clean people's teeth. <laughs> and I realized it because of what I had said to her. And so I sat her down. I'm like, look, I have no right to discourage you. This is the most outlandish thing to do for a living. And somehow I've managed to make it work. They've, they've gone to private school their whole lives. They're like super highly educated. I'm like, I have no right to hold you back by saying some stupid joke. Um, like, do what you want to do. And so uh, she's been studying writing and, and wants to be a filmmaker. And she's a, like an incredible artist, actually, also. Uh, she's going to compete in this thing. Uh, tomorrow's like the practice run where she's going to do like this whole, as for a scholarship, you know, she's just had this huge black piece of paper. And she's going to do a, a kind of a Kim Jong-gi live drawing in white paint. Wow. Um, they're incredibly talented. Even even uh, the oldest who wants to be an engineer uh, is an incredible dress person, but they just all have a different, unique style. And where Sophia is very analytical, like she breaks out all my anatomy books and would copy them. Uh, my, my son will just, he doesn't draw anything like me, um, but his stuff is hysterical and it has a life to it that mine probably will never have. And so... I'm just gonna let them do what they do and we'll keep dumping money into their education. If they still decide to become comic bums, then so <laughs> be it. <laughs> so. Um, Mike, I wanna check on your time. I don't know where an hour just disappeared to. Wow, yeah. But I can keep going a little longer if there's more questions or whatever. Yeah, and I want to I want to plug your new book. But oh, right on. Tell, tell us a little bit and more. And your social media, all of his social yeah, media. Yeah, yeah. And the thing that you, and the thing that you two guys do because you mentioned it but you really yeah. didn't describe it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh. I, yeah well, we can we'll we'll get there. Okay. I think we'll get there. Uh, but Mike, can you maybe touch a little bit more on your Marvel career as it stands right now? You had a long run on Deadpool. Right. Then you you've done things in between your big projects at Marvel too, right? Yeah. So I'm always um, uh, once I went exclusive, I uh, sort of opened up the gates for being able to do more stuff within sort of the Marvel umbrella. So, uh, you know, obviously I, would, I usually had a monthly book of some sort going, and then I would do um, lots of character design stuff for them, uh, both for the books themselves and for their other media projects. I got to do these designs for, um, uh, there's a Hit Monkey animated show coming out. I got to do designs for that. Uh, I did a concept piece for um, Moon Knight, the, the show that is coming out shortly. And, uh, and then bouncing around, like I got to do some uh, event stuff. I got to draw 
a little bit of the infinity countdown stuff with the silver surfer which was like a dream for me like uh i got to actually draw galactus eating a planet <laughs> which was like you know i i have gotten uh you know you guys mentioned about getting to draw characters you want i feel very uh spoiled in that like i've kind of gotten to draw just about every single character i've ever wanted to doing the stuff you'd want them to do like i've gotten to draw like covers with the thing in the hulk fighting um uh you know i got to do the thor thing with simonson um so it's it's been I, i've been very very lucky knock wood uh and then i've been bouncing around a little bit right now so i did Su superior spider-man for a year which was awesome because like once we wrapped up uh, Deadpool, they asked like, Hey, you know, what do you, what do you want to do next? Which I thought was a trick question. I didn't really think, uh, <laughs> like, I just thought they would go, okay, well, you know, you had a good run. We're just going to end out this contract and let you move on. Um, mm -hmm. but they, they were very, Marvel's been super supportive and cool about like, uh, you know, <sighs> Like they want you doing your best work and so they're willing to say like look where would your best work be and we'll try to get you as close to there as possible and i remember i actually asked my son i'm like what should i ask for and he's like spider-man i'm like dude they'll never give it to me but i'll ask and uh to my surprise they're like okay so i got to do a couple of issues of amazing uh with uh, uh you know with nick uh, as editor, and then after that, Nick says, "You know, hey, do you want to do this Superior Spider-Man series? We want to launch. You get to, you know, have your own uh, uh, like fingerprints on this thing because you'd be starting it out. I mean, it had the character had existed before, but you know, getting to relaunch the series and do some cool new stuff. And I'm like, hell yeah! So I got to do um, just about a year on Superior Spider-Man, uh, which was amazing. Like." Uh, it was a very, very cool experience to get to, to just, I mean, Spider-Man is just cool all around, but this version was very fun. Um, Did you like Spider-Man as a kid? Was that like a character that, that yeah, I, you? Yeah, I mean, like, yes and no. Like, um, as a young kid, he was probably my favorite just, you know, in terms of like, if you took me to the store as a little kid and said, pick a coloring book kind of favorite. Um, Later, as I got a little older and I actually started reading comics, I was more of an X-Men kid. Um, but just stylistically and visually, Spider-Man's probably the most, like that's the guy, he's Marvel's Batman, I guess, right? He's that one character that everybody has a version of and everybody wants to draw. Uh, so I felt really, really fortunate to get to do that. And uh, since then, you know, just hopping around, I got to do an issue of Immortal uh, Hulk that came out today and I'm doing a couple issues on another bigger series for them, um, which unfortunately I can't say what it is, but we're sort of working towards. A oh, really come on, just spill the beans. <laughs> come on. Well, you know, but look, you know what the thing is? Um, I, I like to think I'm good at my job, but I know the thing that makes me valuable is, is I know how to keep my mouth shut, right? Like you have to be uh, trustworthy and there's all this stuff that they trust you with, you know, like you have to work on things month or, or, or a year in advance. And, you know, you have to be able to, to like not leak it and blab about it and all that stuff. And because I'm trustworthy, they let me do, you know, stuff, not just for event books, but the TV shows, the cartoons, okay. and all that stuff. So, so we won't say, we won't I spill won't the beans about, about the immortal J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Mike, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're all working towards a, a big, a really, really big series. Uh, and I, again, I can't mention too much about it, but I think scale wise, you know, it could be up there with like, uh, you know, like Civil Marvel's, War, yeah, maybe not Civil War because it's not like an event thing, but it's going to be like a whole big universe that it's, it's going to be very cool. I think. So I wish I could say more about the, the series we're working towards, but uh, I guess just the you know fans should know that all these little fill-ins are just uh, them biding their time so they can get me to the, the big thing we're working towards and I can do all the designs. And um, they, they've been really, really cool about letting, like sort of getting me in my right creative groove, you know? Like uh, I think Marvel's, the thing that makes them fun to work with is like 
it's not so much assignments as much as like, hey, would you have fun doing this thing? Or at least for me, I can't speak for anybody else. So, yeah. Look uh, like you had some questions pop up. I didn't get to read them. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, no, that's what I'm here for, Mike Hawthorne. Okay, Hawthorn. all right. Don't break the contract. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> right. Um, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm in production mode. I got my production hat on. You're the man. You're the man. So I have a two. I have a two pronged question. Okay. Uh, uh, the first part is from our, our guy Mike Thompson, and then I'm going to lead right into Emmanuel's uh, question. Mike Thompson says, Mike Hawthorne, can you describe the process you follow in creating a page, from layouts to final pencil? Is digital involved? If so, how much? And then Emmanuel says, Oh, if I may add a follow up to Mike's question, how much time do you spend on layouts or storyboards before heading into pencils? Oof, yeah. Thank, thanks, guys. Yeah, that's a tough one. So I'll give you my process, but with the caveat that, like, it may, it might all be lies. <laughs> um, like, so generally speaking, um, I will read the script between three and six times. It used to be five, but I've caught myself sort of, you know, if I if I'm familiar with the writer and I feel like I get the gist, read it three times, be done. If it's a new writer you know, read it a few times just because um, I find that it helps me uh, to think about the thing and make sure I really understand what's necessary on the page. Um, because I tend to be very like hyper and like ready to go, um, I tended to like mess things up and not leave space for for dialogue, for, for instance, things like that. So I try to like be really, really careful about reading the script over and over and over. So I feel like I'm getting it. Um, it also, uh, you, you ever hear that, that Dali book, like the, the secrets of the Spanish Academy or whatever it's called, where it's like all these goofy rules and half of them are like, you wonder if he made them up, like mm -hmm. you know, having, oh, yeah. you got to grow a mustache and then put a fig leaf so that you're looking at everything through the fig leaves veins, <laughs> you know, goofy, goofy things like that. But like one of them was, I remember he said something like, you get your canvas ready and then you go to sleep. You never, you don't start your painting because you have to like, you have to let your subconscious think about the pain. It's all this like crazy stuff. And I tend not to be, I tend to be a lot more like uh, pragmatic, but that's one of those things that I find helps me. Like if I've read the script a bunch of times and just thought about it and not gone straight to paper, if I go straight to paper, I tend to like come up with very like uh, like dry by the book layouts. You know what I mean? Mm. Like this step, that step, move here, shuffle, and then you get all the moves in, and it looks like dancing, but there's no magic to it. Um, so that'll be the first step: is read the script a bunch of times, and then write, uh, do little scribbles in the margins for a cool shot you might come up with. And then from there, I'll do a layout. I found, I used to do them big so I could blow them up and tighten them up. Uh, I have found that, that that stiffens up my pages. So the smaller I can make the layouts, the, the looser they are, the better they translate when I try to blow them up into a page. Um, mm -hmm. And those are, those tend to, I might, actually, I might even have, because I was working on layouts today. Can I show this? I don't know if this will. Well, you can just, you just put, put it up to the camera and I'll, I'll give you the screen. I want to make sure there's no, there's no, uh, I'm going to just show a bit of it because I don't want to give away. Uh, I can't see it. It's, there's a glare on it, unfortunately. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Um, the point is they're very, very rough. Um, now, occasionally, to get to Mike's point, um, I will then either go straight from that, just looking at that and blow it up on a page. Um, but if I'm feeling a little uh, stuck, I'll take a picture of them, of the layout, bring it into Procreate on my iPad, and then tighten up the layout so I can blow it up and print that out to pencil it. Um, that's not often. It's just usually when I'm feeling a little like like just if it's like a complicated scene or, or something that I feel like I'm not quite getting with a little thumbnail. Um, and I can either print that out onto a sheet of 11 by 17 and then tighten up the pencils or just go straight from looking at that little layout and kind of block it in with a blue pencil or a red pencil and then tighten it up with graphite. 
Um, I'm so the second part of that was how long that takes, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm for the most part kind of a page a day artist, uh, which is probably about the rate you need to be at to be able to keep up with a book, but not like sacrifice quality. And I can go much faster, um, but I'm never happy with the book then. Um, the layouts can sometimes take a couple of days. <clears throat> now, the reason I said that these might all be lies is because I, I tend to change my, my process a good bit or, uh, or omit it altogether. Like there was a point on Deadpool where like I could go straight on the page without layouts because I kind of knew what I was going to do. I've read the script so many times. I got so comfortable working with Jerry that I kind of knew what he was looking for. Um, that I could go straight to the page. Same with Superior Spider-Man after a while working with Christos, like I felt like, okay, I got these. I don't have to spend a day doing layouts. I can go straight to the page. So mm -hmm. hopefully that answers both questions. Did I miss any any bits from that? No, I think I think that was pretty good. Okay, cool. I was just curious about when you said you would get, if you jumped into it too quick, you wouldn't leave enough room for copy. Does that mean you're working Marvel style or you were? Oh, uh, not not as much. I mean, it depends. The last time I did a Marvel thing, was a uh, Marvel style thing, was I guess the uh, the the stuff with Tom DeFalco on the Midnight Records, the Machine Man uh, backup thing. Um, but I I just had a I get so excited about the visuals that I would have a, a tendency early on to like, oh wait, I forgot there needs to be balloons on these pages. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of those things that like, if I don't read the script a bunch of times, uh, I will forget to, to leave. Because I tend to try to act out, like to get what the writer's saying the character should be doing uh, mm -hmm. uh, across, even with like facial expressions and stuff. Mm -hmm. And to me, like the dialogue ends up being almost so secondary that I have to remind myself to leave space for it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I probably should clarify with the Marvel stuff, the Marvel method of writing, it's just a paragraph with a description. There's usually no dialogue. And, yeah. the, and the writers will add the dialogue after you've drawn the pages, right. um, which is great because then, you know, if you didn't leave a lot, a lot of space, they can just not write a lot of dialogue. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I th and it varies from artists, I mean, from from writer to writer because some writers write the marvel style but then give you a little bit of yeah specific yeah. dialogue because it's like by this point he has to say or she right. has to say this thing right or they right. have to be at this this place and other people like from page 13 6 to 13 spider-man battles dr doom on the rooftop yeah yeah absolutely and and uh and that can be fun i mean like jerry and i got to the point where he would um like there was a fight scene. The first time we did it was a fight scene between Deadpool and Black Panther. And he's like, look, um, I could write the fight scene, but you're better at it than I am. So I needed to begin here and end here. Uh, and you got eight pages to do it. And he let me choreograph the whole fight. And then he kind of plugged in this hysterical dialogue in there, uh, which is always fun. I mean, as long as it doesn't feel like a crutch for the writer, like you can kind of tell when a guy's going, you know, I don't feel like working today. Can you just give me five pages of a fight? <laughs> right. um, yeah. But I've been lucky in that most of the writers, when I work with them, they, they do it out of respect for what I end up bringing to the page, which is always nice. Yeah. I think people sort of forget too, when we say Marvel method, that our Marvel method is almost a, uh, an adaption of the actual Marvel method because, you know, Kirby and Lee would have a phone call or a talk yeah. and then Jack would go off and draw the story. Yeah. And yeah. then Stan would get it. And then we go, Oh yeah. And there's this new guy, the silver surfer here, or there's this other, other character. Yeah. Sometimes he would have him redraw a page occasionally right. to do something. But I mean, it was not even like here's right. An outline per se. Yeah, you know, yeah, um, yeah. Because if you actually read Kirby's stuff after he stopped working with Lee, the pacing is the same. The dialogue is not right. the same, but the way he paced the stories is pretty much the same. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And it definitely wasn't this sort of mini film production that it is now, where you get a 
like a teleplay kind of script, you know, and, you know, this panel. Luckily, there's not a lot of like, you know, in this panel, I need an upshot or downshot. There's not a lot of that. Um, you, but you do definitely get panel breakdowns and dialogue and that kind right. of thing, you know, yeah. which is fine. It's perfectly okay either way for me. Um, it's probably less work when it's written in that way. Because when you have the Marvel thing, you have to sit with the paragraph. And I, I tend to go through and make notes on the script and say, okay, from here to here, that's one panel. From here to there is two panels. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm up to eight panels. I can combine these two. Uh, right. So that, that can take a little, that's a little more labor intensive. Yeah. Some the of the older, the older guys, as we were talking about earlier, they didn't like to get the Marvel method. Because they felt and they were actually doing the writer's job and their job. I mean, true. So, I can see that. so they were like, "No, I want a full script because then I know, yeah, what I'm gonna gonna." I think Apero was like that. He wanted a full, right? And then I, I heard mean, I heard stories that like Gene Coleman would have to cram in the end of some of the stories sometimes because he would be like real loose in the in the right. middle, and all of a sudden, oh no, I gotta, yeah, yeah, I gotta yeah, you it at the end. You yeah, know? you see these comics for like. You know, there's five panel pages for like 18 pages, and then the last, you know, the end of the story is like six, seven, eight panels per page. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying to squeeze it all in. Yeah, I, I, I've been lucky. I've been like, I mean, I'm probably a little picky too in terms of, you know, I want to make sure like, like it's I'm a good fit for the thing. Um, but I've been very lucky with the folks I, I write, I work with that they're very mindful and try to like, they they. The writers I've worked with have been very cool about letting me do the things that I'm good at and then just filling in the gaps that they need to do. And and I don't mind the Marvel method. Um, I don't mind. I don't feel like I, I wrote the story or anything like that. Um, but I think it's it's probably more about the writers you're working with. It just the guys that I've worked with that have done that, I never got the impression they were doing it to like, uh, you know, put all the work on me. Mm -hmm. um, right, and when, I would imagine they those guys didn't feel you know super appreciated all the time, so that makes you grumpy. Yeah, yeah. when you were when you were coming along in the beginning, who were you looking at to develop your your uh, your mechanics of doing comics? Yeah, um, a lot of Will Eisner early on. Um, not really even realizing like the huge age gap between us just because he was like loose and super energetic. And like, um, I remember reading his how to book where he's talking about timing using a drippy water faucet and things like that. And I just remember thinking like, that's that he knows the way. And, uh, so that was a big one for me. Uh, Alex Toth, um, when I got, you know, this was a little later. Early on, I was a I was a big Jim Lee fan. As like when I was reading the X Men, uh, I liked uh, he, him and Mark Silvestri, um, just for like the kind of classic dynamic like, '90s superhero stuff. Um, you guys, frankly, Brett, I remember looking at how you drew women and thinking like, I gotta I gotta steal from this guy. <laughs> um, I actually brought you up in a class once, believe it or not. Uh, I remember saying that like probably the closest thing we have to perfect pitch for for visual artists is the ability to like just see a composition for for what it should be and i use you as an example for that because like i remember seeing some old i want to say they were like pirates of the caribbean pages and it was like a fight scene on a boat and i remember looking at it going like what the hell how the hell how is he putting all that on a page, but I can still understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, later I would say it was, it was guys like, like Toth and, and uh, the Hernandez brothers, mostly Jaime. Um, and I bounced around quite a bit. I mean, like you'd have like a, a favorite artist every week, you know, as, as you discover stuff, mm. I had like Sergio Topi, phase i had a claire wendling phase like you know what i mean um so i i think i just picked up wherever i could i didn't uh i don't know that i had any one in super instructive artist that i just pointed out and said okay that's my guy or girl uh and just learn try to learn from everybody you know 
And I think that's one of the things that's unique about comics is that you have to do so much drawing. Yeah. So, so much incredible that you are constantly looking to inject some energy into your blood because you just have to pull so much out of your brain all the time. Yeah. When you come across someone like Claire Wendling, it's just this magic explosion. Yeah. Yeah. Some elements that she synthesizes so beautifully that it re-inspires you to try her. Right. Yeah. So, and she's a special, I mean, like there's lots of us that draw. And then there's a couple of these like upper echelon people that everybody recognizes. There's something there that like none of us can quite touch. I remember being in France and like, I believe this is when Claire first fell ill and she hadn't been drawing and we we're on a train and everybody got like hushed and they're like, oh my God. And they were talking as if it was, it was a tragedy that she wasn't drawing anymore. Mm. Um, and of course she's rebounded and she's been doing these art books that are amazing. Um, but yeah, there's, she's a special kind of artist that like, I have to be careful, I think with looking at, cause I, I never wanted to be like, I never wanted to get too close to an artist cause I didn't want to be comparing my stuff to theirs too much mm -hmm. or, or, or uh, God forbid, like copying from them. Yeah. And so she's one of those people that's so, uh, She's so influential that you have to be careful. It's it's too pure. You got to cut. You got to cut that. You can't take it straight. <laughs> you know something about her too is that she only draws what she feels like drawing. Right. It right. Gives that power that you cannot really translate to working from scripts. A Amen. Yeah. That last, uh, the second to the last art book that she picked up, where she started to jump back into the game. You know, she says in the book how she just got a ream of paper and just started drawing little fairies every day. Yeah. And that's how she sort of brought herself back. Um, that's amazing. And you look at that book and I'm like, I, there's no way I can't like, what, what can you even do with that other than just admire it and know that it's an untouchable kind of unattainable level and just be happy that people like that exist yeah. in the world. You know what I mean? Well, I talked to her in uh, Seattle. I saw her the last right on out there and she she'd written about it or maybe i'd seen an interview with her but she was talking about um that the the, the nervous stress for her yeah trying to adapt to an animation studio demands or right demands of storytelling on a comic book page because as we all know part of the discipline of doing this is you have to find ways to make things that are not particularly exciting to look at interesting right. so you right. can, the, the good part you got to have the exposition in there right and I think that that particular aspect of it just drove her nuts because, you know, there's she's got to draw something that essentially has no inherent interest in right. it. Right, right. And it was very hard for her to tap into some, it's like an outside force you bring in to make yourself think of some way to make this interesting. Yeah, yeah. Like, and you know, she could do it. I always got the impression that, like, there's certain people, and maybe I'm probably talking her up too much, but, like, it almost seems like, it's maybe beneath her a little bit. Like it's a little, and I don't mean that in a snobby way. That's not the right wording, but like she's, she's a, like she's a sports car and we're asking her to drive the groceries home. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> good way to put it. This is a, this is a bad use of her ability, yeah. you know, like, and, and, uh, and it makes sense to me that that would drive her nuts. Cause like she, why, 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 you yeah. know? <laughs> well, you probably yeah. see that also, to, to go into your teaching a little bit, you know, you see that when you see different personalities of students, yeah. there's certain people that are very good, but they don't have the personality to overlay onto a commercial aspect. Right, right, right. And, I, and, and with their style even, I mean, um, you know, I, I, when I first started teaching at PCAT, it was for visual development because I had a background doing a little bit of storyboards for commercials. And I did a little, some boards with, for Chris on hop. And so, and I'd done character design. So I came in with that and like, I tried to be really careful not to have like a very narrow definition of what visual development or character design or concept art was. And you remind myself of like, um, like the, the concept art for like, I mentioned Hercules earlier. Uh, what's his name? Scarf uh, right. uh, did for that. It's like, I would show that to certain students and going like, you know, not all concept art looks like the stuff for the new Halo game. 
Mm. Uh, sometimes it's just that you bring in a genius to to do special stuff and he drives or she drives the production forward. And um, I think someone like Claire, you mentioned her studio work and imagine having to do that and not, you know, speaking French and all that. Um, and then they gave her tasks and it probably wasn't the right thing. They probably should have just said, here's a ream of paper, come up with cool stuff. Yeah, inspire. And, uh, inspire. Right. Yeah. right. And, or uh, you work on something for six months and then they go, that whole part of the film doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. No, I mean, it, yeah, absolutely. Like, so I would try to get these students to, to like, because there's this tendency to like all concept art is video game stuff and let them play with their styles. And it's been long enough teaching that like, I've gotten to see a couple of these, these people who maybe weren't super successful at school, go on to do cool stuff. And they'll like every so often reach out and thank me. Like, you know, thanks for not trying to talk me out of drawing the way I draw. And, and that's super cool. That that's, that's a pretty big payoff for me. I think that like, I didn't squash anybody's unique style. Cause like, I feel like I did that to myself. I had a, kind of a, a wackier, unique style starting out and trained it out of myself, right? Like obsessively studying anatomy and things like that. Um, and so there are times when like, I'll see glimpses of it in my sketchbooks, but when it comes time to do the pages, I don't quite let that out. And so I wanted to be careful not to do that to any students, you know? Why do you think, why do you, why do you think that when you, you go to your, the pages, you would do that do you feel like you you need to rate like it's it's too crazy you need to rein it in somehow or yeah I, yeah I guess I guess so I mean there's a there's a, a certain element of like um being trying to be mindful of the expectations for the things that I'm brought in for um you know I'm not like I'm not I'm not a uh I'm probably more of a workhorse to Claire's sports car you know and like um, I try to come into the job with, uh, understanding the expectations that the clients have. Yeah. And that doesn't mean they're asking me to limit anything, but like, I know that if, you know, if I had an issue with Deadpool and all of a sudden I'm like, Hey, I want to draw all this with my left hand and make it look like, uh, <laughs> I ran out of ink halfway through. So I switched to charcoal and like, fans and editors and would be like you know i don't understand what the hell <laughs> just happened to you um so i tend to reserve it for like my own stuff uh mm. sketchbooks the art books the stuff i'm doing with you know kickstarter patreon whatever and the little indie you know comics i do um but i'm starting to realize that like it's maybe not a good plan long term like, i should probably let some of the stuff that happens in the sketchbook happen on uh the page too so you so, sort of would you i i sometimes think of it like when i do the strips it's almost because they're legacy strips right and spider-man is sort of a legacy character right that there is an expectation from the audience like you said that it should you're playing the character now right and it sort of goes with like if you go too far some people would go cool and other people would go. Mm. Yeah. I, I tend to think, I, I mean, early on I, I bounced around with styles with every book I did. And my rationale was that if I was a filmmaker, I would shoot all these films differently. Like if I was making a war film, I wouldn't shoot it the same way I shot a romantic comedy. So with these superhero comics to me, they're sort of like big blockbuster action movies. And so when I approach them, I try to draw them with that in mind. Um, and that's and that's that's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I just think that I'm probably at the point where I realize I, I should loosen up a little bit. Like, not not every action blockbuster movie has to look a certain way, and I probably could you know loosen up and do some more bonkers stuff. And so, um, I think I'm starting to see it more in the pages. I mentioned those uh, Silver Surfer pages. Um, there was a there was a lot more of like my sketchbook in those pages than than uh, I had probably done previously, just because certain things allow me to sort of open up and go nuts with. Um, so it kind of depends on the script too. I think like if the script is more reserved, 
I don't want to I don't want to feel like I'm shoehorning the script into my weird style for it. So I try to be adaptive and like rein it back a little bit, like with the Hulk thing that I just did. Um, that was a little bit more reserved of a story, and there was some like emotional stuff going on between uh, Banner and his ex-wife, and um, the the more like serious tone of that series uh, would have. I, I needed to sort of like chill out a little bit and like do a more reserved kind of finish and layout to the book. So I'm I'm letting out more of that kind of crazy sketchbook stuff without it like without it like turning off the reader because all of a sudden like they got something they didn't expect from me. And maybe that makes me sound a little hacky, but um, I try to take seriously that like there's my stuff and there's the stuff that people are hiring me to do. And uh, I want my stuff to be unique to me, but I also want to be mindful that like I'm supposed to be a professional and the client has certain expectations and the fans have even more specific expectations. And as long as I'm not compromising anything that I do, um, I think it's fair game to like do a more superhero style instead of like going nuts. So, and there are people who, you know, like McFarlane, that was a thing that was part of who he was. That was his brand to have a very stylized Spider-Man, um, which I dug. But if I was to do that, it would throw everybody off. They'd go like, what the hell? What? This is not, uh, a, this isn't the mic that we thought we hired. If that makes yeah. sense. That doesn't mean I won't say, hey, I have a different idea for how I want to approach this. What do you think? And we'll sort of discuss it. Uh, and Marvel's always been very cool about that. So I'm, I'm slowly getting to where I'm in, including more of that loose kind of sketchbook work without it uh, feeling like I'm springing it on anybody, if that makes any yeah. sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always think of, of, of Mobius with that yeah. because he had Blueberry style right, and then the Mobius style. Right. And towards the end, they kind of merged more than they did in the beginning. You know the stuff he was doing in the late '60s, early '70s. Right. He was doing Blueberry. Didn't have the same kind of finish. And later on, I was just looking at one before we podcasted today. You can see them bl them blending. Right. More. Yeah, and he's a perfect example, I think, because like, I think he's thought of as like an author as opposed to just an, a comic artist, and everybody respects him to death. But like he would still adapt his work to the story at hand, right? Like um, he didn't draw everything the same way. And so that's kind of uh, how I approach things. It just so happens that I've been doing a lot of superhero comics and that's what everybody's seeing. So there's an expectation to like, oh, this is how Mike draws. Not realizing, no, this is how Mike draws superhero comics. If I picked up his little horror comic he did, I'd be surprised that it doesn't look anything like Deadpool. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Well, I remember, uh, I can't remember who said it, though. It might have been someone like Dean Cornwell or Meet Schaefer. They were talking about the role of the illustrator. And they said the, the hardest thing about being good at this job is that if a client gives you, a, gives you an assignment on a Thursday, you have to turn it in on a Tuesday. You've never heard of the subject matter. You don't know anything about it. That whole feeling about it, but when you turn that picture in, it has yeah. to look like you've waited your whole life to do that. Yes, and yes, that's tough energy to call up. Yeah, that's at your a hundred percent right. I mean, that's it's funny you should mention because I mentioned like with Conan, I wasn't necessarily a fan before, I'd never read a Deadpool comic before I drew it. Um, but the fans had, and so I had to come to the book like respectful of like the history of the character and all the love that because the fans are hardcore and if i came in kind of like eh, i don't care about this deadpool thing it's just a, a gig yeah. um you know it would have seemed inauthentic and nobody would have mm. nobody would have uh, uh, enjoyed it and at the end of the day our job is to give people an enjoyable reading experience yeah and um it ended up looking like, oh, I was the biggest Deadpool fan in the world. And people would like ask me questions. I'm like, you know, what are his swords names? I'm like, I'm not sure. You know, like 
Um, I know now it's Bay and Arthur, but I'm just saying, I think that's what it is. Um, but the point is, is yeah, you got to very quickly become a, a, an Uber fan of a, of a thing that you're on and research it to death and make sure that, you know, people think like, damn, this is, this was the, I, I get a lot of like, oh man, you were made to draw this thing. Yeah. Now. Right. And Which is what you want. Right. I take it as a compliment. That means I did the homework. Well, you know, the thing you were talking about, the sketchbook always reminded me of a, a great quote by Mark Twain, where he said, to, to be the best writer you can be, you have to learn how to murder your darlings. <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. If you come up with this beautiful sentence, it has this poetic rhythm to it, but it's out of place. Yeah. And the story needs at that moment, you have to kill it and rewrite it. And yeah. I think I often find that conflict with, with the, the kind of energy you get in sketchbooks back to the power of Claire Wendling again, where you're just letting it all rip. Right. Come to a story though. And even sometimes, like you say, you're doodling on the side of the page, going through it the first time, you get this really wicked looking shot. Right. Then you go to put it all together and a page is like a puzzle where every piece has to fit, eye has right. to go through it. You realize this drawing is out of step for the moment. Yeah. And this panel belongs to this character. Yeah. I, I can't put use this here. And that's a skill that you have to learn how to develop if yeah. feeling is really important to you. Which you know. And it's a bummer sometimes. Like you just yeah. feel like this is a great panel and yeah. I can't use it. Yeah. And, and I think it makes, um, I mean, you can tell the guys that don't do that and you'll have like a pinup with a bunch of little panels around yeah. it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, uh, you know, the thing about comics and you've worked in film too. I, I, uh, when I was teaching some workshops on this stuff, I had a hard time, making people understand this, you know, inexperienced students, but you can be a pretty mediocre storyteller and do really cool comics. Yeah. But you yeah. can't be a mediocre storyteller and storyboard a film. It won't work. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I found that out pretty fast. <laughs> it's like, so it's uh, a yeah, you know, the first couple of times I did boards, I, I was, I was treating it like a comic and, uh, you know, do you get the directors like, Hey, this is a cool shot, but I'd have to cut a hole in the floor to put the camera there. <laughs> and the story is crazy. And like, yeah, so you're right. You're a hundred percent right, dude. Well, the thing is, is that there's certain kind of energy to the drawing and a charm. It's almost like a, an artist is kind of like an actor in a way where their, their charisma of their style can really carry a lot of, of, uh, I guess you would call it implied narrative. If yeah. it's just cool to look at and you're enjoying being in that world and then hopefully the writer's picking up the slack if they're not hitting the notes particularly, then it can be yeah. a really enjoyable book. Yeah, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I, one of the bigger compliments I, I really am grateful for is when people go, hey, we really don't need the words. Like I can read this whole comic and I know what's going on. And then I feel like, okay, I've done my job. I mean, you want it to look cool too um, but if it looks cool and they can't follow the story, then you've let the reader down, you know, and you want them to get their four or five bucks worth, you know, out of each, each issue. Yeah, you know? I agree. Yeah. Um, all right. So Mike, uh, before we run out of time, I want to, I want to give you the chance to spend some time with your new, uh, project that's coming out. Oh, uh, so do you, do you happiness will follow up? or because yeah, i got a half yeah. dozen of them at this point i've been yeah let's talk about that and i have some stuff to show once okay we... cool yeah i um this is actually uh happiness will follow is uh an auto bio comic it's really more about uh my mother but it's it's the the the, the pitch was that it was an autobiographical book um it was actually it's kind of a it's got a little bit of a crazy history because um, it was from my time at Vertigo. It came about, uh, I didn't actually pitch this book. Um, at the time, uh, the brief and wondrous life of Oscar Wilde had just won, I think it was a Pulitzer or something. And I was in New York with the uh, editor at Vertigo. And we're talking about this book and I made the offhand joke. They're like, Hey, that happened to me. Like I was cursed when I was a little kid and his, you know, his eyes bugged down and his ear perked up and he asked me to tell him the whole story. And I did. And he says, if you ever want to make that into a book, I will publish it. Now, in those days, you know, people would like sell one of their kids to get a Vertigo book, right? Like it was, you know, it was the, the hit place to be. And I was already illustrating stuff for them. But to get to write and draw something was super unique. And um, I never, ever, ever 
I mean, you look at my body of work, I never intended to be an autobiographical comic guy. Um, but I thought, well, I ha how often does Vertigo say, don't pitch me, give me this book, I will publish it. Mm. So I thought, well, I'll do this and then I'll pitch them a book. And, and you know, this will be sort of my gateway to a Vertigo series. <laughs> um, so this is probably about 10 years ago or more. Uh, and we did the book, spent a year on the script and about nine months on the art. And it was a huge undertaking for me. And it was a lot of ugly stuff that I, I didn't realize I, I, I was going to hate revisiting. Um, but we got a pretty good book out of it. And then uh, there were some big fundamental changes going on at DC. And there were, you know, nobody knew this at the time, but they were going to move out to LA and, and, everything was being topsy-turvy there. And, and, you know, we didn't even know if Vertigo was going to be around. So the book didn't get published and we had some legal wranglings to try to get the rights back. Um, and I was thankfully successful, although it was scary. There was a period of time where Warner Brothers owned my life story. Mm. Um, and uh, I sat on it for 10 years because I was so scared of the thing. I was so scared to pitch it. I'd almost lost it. I wasn't sure I wanted to put personal work like this out there because I have not been very brave with my work. It, it's been, uh, you know, focused on just the drawing and not so much on letting folks in. Um, and it was Eric, actually Jerry Dugan, uh, the writer of Deadpool, that talked me into showing it to the folks at Boom who immediately got it and were like, please let us publish this thing. Uh, and so we ended up doing, we expanded it with, uh, since it, there's been such a gap between when it was done till now, um, uh, we expanded it by another 20 pages where it's sort of a, uh, an epilogue to, to all the stuff that happens in the book, but it's, it's heavy. It's probably not as fun as Deadpool, <laughs> um, but the reviews have been pretty incredible. And, uh, it's a weird, it's a weird, I'm not real sure how to talk about the thing because um, it's very intensely personal and there's a lot of like uh, ugly stuff that happened that like, and, and I, I was holding back quite a bit, but it's still, when you read it, it's a little visceral and I'll show it to people and they sort of react in this way like, Jesus, Mike, what? I mean, this is a, it's a great book, but like, <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> That you're letting all this out. So, um, yeah, I'm probably not selling it very well. <laughs> well did you did you feel cathartic after you had done it when you can look at it now? Or is it there's a I, I did not. I think that's I don't know if that's really a thing for artists where they 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 revisit an ugly thing and then they're like, ah, that feels better, but it's no. <laughs> I mean, I will occasionally lie and tell people. Uh, that, yeah, you know, it was nice to, to work out some of these things, um, but it's it's almost never really true. It's the thing I'd end up saying to people to make them feel comfortable because the material is a little heavy. Um, and but it was eye opening. I mean, um, in researching the book, I I got to learn about uh, some of my my family. I I grew up just with my mother, who was from directly from Puerto Rico. She came to the mainland when she was about 15. And her experiences are like ex uniquely different from, from mine uh, as sort of a born, uh, mainland born Puerto Rican. And uh, I didn't know my father who was white and uh, he had a whole family and I have siblings and everything. Um, so it was, it was eye opening to learn some of the stuff about her that I didn't know and just uh, I think she had some real major issues with mental illness and and how much she hid from me, um, you know, big things and small things. Like I, you know, I, uh, I found out, we found her, one of her IDs and realized like I had two different birthdays for her. So I'm not even sure how old 100% she is or she was when she passed. She died about 20 years ago. Um, so it was, it was eye opening, but it certainly wasn't cathartic. I, 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 to this day, uh, you know, the book's out on the 21st and I'm still not sure I did the right thing by selling <laughs> selling the book. There are times when, you know, I'm like, 
sitting up at night going like, oh, like maybe you should just see if you can get the book back. <laughs> um, you know, it's probably, probably a good sign that it's it's a it's a special book for me. I think the reason this kind of thing has impacts on people is that almost I I don't know what the number would be. Let's say seventy five percent of people have very difficult things in their past. Yeah, and uh, that's why they respond to this kind of thing because you have to find some way to cope with the terrible things that happen to you, and the act of succeeding at that gives the impression that you didn't go through it. Yeah, yeah. So you know, when people see someone has had the courage to share some of these things, I think it's really important for people. I mean, that's what literature is. Yeah. And, and I guess, I, I think my look at it is, is skewed for a couple of reasons. Number one is that I never intended to make this book, right? Because it was asked of me and I just thought, well, it'll be a good opportunity, not really giving enough thought to how difficult it was going to be to do this stuff. Um, there's still part of me that's like, you never really wanted to make this book. You're doing it because it's, it's done. And this is sort of the job and, and you're used to putting out books and I had been sitting on it for 10 years. And I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not resolved to the fact that I'm actually putting this book out there for people to, and, and Jamar has pointed out, like, I probably have been a little too private uh, with myself during my career, you know, like not going to cons, uh, not doing tons of interviews. And that's changed dramatically in the last couple of years between doing Patreon and, and just deciding like, if I'm willing to put this book out, then, then it's silly to like still stay outside of the comics culture. It probably should just jump in with both feet. Um, but it's, a, I would be lying if I didn't say it was very difficult to, to, to put this book out. And I think there's also a part of me that was resentful of it. I felt like uh, it was like, you know, just uh, personal trauma porn. Like I, I, I would start to feel like people are going to like this book, not because it's good, but because I'm, I'm letting them see all the hurt. And, mm -hmm. and I know that's like poisonous to think of it that way, but like you tell yourself these ugly things because you think, the quality of the story is not there. It's just that it's so crazy that people will will pay you to see you sort of cut yourself, you know, like hurt yourself kind of thing. And I realized like how skewed that is. And I realized that like I wasn't able to look at this book clearly, which means I probably need to let it go. I feel like if there's going to be any catharsis to this thing, it probably would be I don't know, the year after this book has come out and I realize, you know, you know what? I didn't, nothing, nothing bad happened. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> everything worked out. It wasn't, you know. It, it might help somebody. It might help some, you, mm -hmm. you doing mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I mean, you know, this is a teacher. Sometimes you help a student, Actually, not yeah. with anything that you're showing them how to draw. Right. But by you being a resource to tell them that that thing that they're going through that problem that they're having in their life, you had something similar or you can give them some perspective because yeah. what you, what you're talking about is perspective. Right. You're probably right. I mean, the truth is you do, you know, teaching, especially at the, at, at the college level with some of these students that have like, and I know like millennials get a hard, a, a bad rap, but like they've had to grow up in this whole post nine 11 world where like everything's a little scary and you end up sort of, counseling some of them on how difficult a career this is. And you're right. I guess I don't, even then I don't share as much as, uh, like usually when, when something like that comes up with a student, I tend to just like hear them out thinking that I don't want to be that guy. that's like, Hey, I know that pain because I did a similar thing. Um, and somehow it's not valid. So I just hear them out and tell them like, that's fine to feel that way. And here's why it'll work out. Um, and probably you're right. Teaching has sort of made me open up a little more than I, I would have, especially the first few years of teaching, I was very guarded and I was very focused on, you know, this is what the anatomy is and this is what you're going to have to practice and blah, blah, blah. And after a few years, you know, 
students would come back. I remember one particular moment where I realized that it wasn't just the lessons. It was a student that like hated her work so much. She broke down crying uh, and was willing to like not take a grade. She would rather not get a grade if she didn't have to show her work during the crit. That's mm -hmm. how much she hated her work. And I remember like having to make the call that, okay, you don't have to participate knowing that like that can blow up in your face. And next thing you know, every student's wanting to not participate because they're like, oh, you know, I'm, I just don't like it, um, which didn't happen. But, you know, talking with her and realizing like, well, shit, I do have to offer more than just a crit and fix this, make that blue, make that bigger. Um, so you're right. Maybe, I don't know. We'll see. Well, I know, Mike, just from our conversations and also teaching and being in spaces, and I've seen how your students worship you. And I think that's something like, right, you, you know, you're a role model, even if you don't want to look at yourself that way, but you being in a space with a bunch of students who are enamored with just your height of skill, and then you're also making yourself available to teach them something is really powerful. Wow. Um, That's incredible. Thank you. I don't, I'm going to try to keep from talking you out of it. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> I just I, say I thank mean, you. No, you know, and it's, you know, like I said, I, I know a lot of your students who are graduating and going on to really great things and they yeah. adore you. And, you know, some of it's like, oh, you know, Hawthorne is my teacher. And there's like a little bit of a cult of, Hawthorne that you created. And I know you have nothing to yeah. do with it because you don't yeah. like that kind of attention. Yeah, but, I mean, it, I, I do see I do see it because there's a small cadre of, of, of students that will come back yeah. and uh, and visit and, and it's it's cool. It's um, but but that's the power of teaching, right? You've made yeah. a connection with students and sometimes it's not about how to draw the clavicle. It's right. that you're there and you're willing to help them in this part of their life. And yeah, that's yeah. It, 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 it's, it's been, it's probably, I've probably gotten more from it than I've given to these guys and girls. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, two, two of my past students, actually, I hired them to color this book. Mm -hmm. um, Sam Bowen and Ari, uh, I've always get her, not, like, I changed her last name to Punchinski because I thought it sounded funny, but I think it's Pluchinski, and uh, I love them to death, and they were two of those students that just kept in touch and kept, like, just being incredibly, like, kind, but also professional and smart, and I like to think that uh, they trust me because I haven't, like, abused that in any way, and if I can, I really, really try to, like, even if it's just to throw their names and hats for gigs, I mean, if I could, I would have a whole army of them in a studio somewhere making stuff, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, but it's, you're, I'm grateful to them. They're, they've been really, they've been amazing. And um, yeah, I probably get more out of it than I give for sure. Um, I want to uh, throw a couple more things at you, then we're going to turn out the lights. But okay. I think this has been a great time catching up with you. And right what on. we were we were saying before we went on air that Mike is probably, you're the most, you're the repeat offender out of all of the, <laughs> the podcasting and articles we've written. Which is I, surreal, man. Because I interviewed you like years ago. I think you were doing Machine Team I, right then. Yeah, I think you're right for Draw Magazine, which I was, it was an incredible honor. I remember, uh, I actually remember, I won't tell you the reporter's name. But I remember being so proud of it. And I told this reporter in New York, and she's like, why? She couldn't believe that you guys were interviewing me. And I'm like, I don't get it either. I don't know. <laughs> so I was I was grateful. I was very grateful. It was very it was a high point for sure. It also, I don't know, I, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of people thought you you were missing an eye. Oh, because it because <laughs> we had an eye patch on. Yeah, I had um I gave you photos because I never, I always avoid these headshots because I can't stand them. But uh, a friend of mine was a filmmaker and I was in a short film of his and he, he, was, he took some photographs and stuff. And um, we went to some abandoned factory or something in the middle of the night. And, and just, I just put a patch on like a slick Rick homage <laughs> thing. And, uh, and it never occurred to me 
uh, that, yeah, that people really thought I only had one eye, which is hysterical. I feel like I'm, I'm not nearly that cool. Like I'm letting them down. <laughs> so which, which one is the glass eye, Mike? <laughs> this one. <laughs> Uh, to also, and Mike was in our last issue of Draw, on yeah, the, yeah, and did the cover too, which is an honor. And that was just on the audio podcast. So, so I have, Thank a, you. I, have, I have a question from our good buddy Stu K. And you, know oh Stu. man, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know Stu. Stu says hello. He doesn't have a picture on his thing, but it's hey, okay. Stu. I didn't hide him, Mike and the crew. I he went to did. school with Stu, and he had the coolest. Uh, so we. He was in, uh, uh, I think, the design department. I was in the painting department, and everybody had to have a senior show, and you had to make a, you know, an invitation for your show, and you do a postcard and everything that you normally do in the fine arts world. And Stu walks up to us and hands us a crayon, and I'm like, "What the hell is this?" And I look at it, and the wrapper was the invitation to his his show. <laughs> it was the coolest. I, he, I wonder if he even remembers, but. Uh, yeah, I was. I I had it for a long time. I think I misplaced it recently, recently in the last couple of years. But it'll turn up. I still I kept it, Stu. That's great. Uh, yeah. Stu asked Mike, any plans on doing anything with your early hysteria series? Thanks, Stu. Oh yeah, that's a tough question because like I I now that we've been doing all these kickstarters and patreons and stuff, uh, we have toyed around with the idea of sort of remastering it, rescanning all the stuff, doing new letters and uh coloring it um i just haven't nailed it down because there's a part of me that knows if i go down that rabbit hole again uh i have to continue with it i don't want to just like put out a remastered hysteria and not come out with a, a new series shortly after um i'm playing around with some ideas with a couple of friends of mine uh, with bringing back hysteria in a form that maybe people wouldn't expect. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to blow it up and then have it be a letdown, but it may not just be comics um, if I get my way, mm -hmm. but it might take a, a couple of years. So Puppets? Puppets? Uh, it's funny <laughs> to say it. It's not that far from, <laughs> believe it or not, yeah, it's not that far from some of the plans we've been talking. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> there's a couple other questions here, but I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, okay. we're going to ask, uh, Mike, uh, after everything is said and done, if he can go back into the Facebook feed or maybe the YouTube feed and maybe answer some questions. Sure. Yeah. I'd be happy to on his own time. So don't feel like you, you wasted your time, dear, dear viewers. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I want to, uh, let Mike get back to his family. And I think this was a really good episode. Um, I also want to real quick on your way out, Mike, maybe talk about your social media and your yeah, Patreon yeah. and your Kickstarter and whatever else you got popping right this second. Yeah. So, I mean, it, people can check me out just about everywhere. I tend to jump on uh, all the social medias to, just to claim my name because early on in my career, uh, someone uh, got MikeHawthorne.com. So, yeah. So, I, I, I learned pretty quickly that, like, isn't there a senator named Mike Hawthorne or something like that, uh, or, or, or a prose writer? Or something? So I don't think it was anybody. There, there are a couple of Mike Hawthorns. I don't think it was any of them because nobody ever put anything on the site. Mm -hmm. Like it, it was clear someone just registered it, and then just sat on it. And I haven't checked in a couple of years, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't. I don't believe it's anybody official, or else you would expect to have seen a website in the last you know fifteen years or whatever it's been. Um, but the main one I'm focusing on is obviously uh, Patreon, uh, which is Mike Hawthorne Art. Um, just because I've been using it as a, I do tons and tons of sketching and I've been using it as an outlet for that. So I'm getting back to like a lot of self-publishing uh, and I'm doing a, like a quarterly zine version of this All City mm. book. Um, that, that, that I wrote the foreword for. Yes, he did. Thank you, sir. That we kickstarted. Um, and we're going to be doing another one, uh, probably September or October if the world doesn't end. Uh, I'd like to do one big, uh, all city art book a year and the quarterly signs will sort of feed into that. So through the Patreon, um, at like the intro level, you get, you know, uh, uh two, we, this has been a big dispute with Jamar and I, a bi-monthly or bi-weekly 
podcast. <laughs> Basically, twice a month, we do a Q and A. Uh, you get a um, a process video, and then at the ten dollar tier, you get a digital zine every month, which is just us collecting high resolution scans and making them into like a digital PDF. And then that the best stuff from that goes into a print zine that we do every quarter. And then every year we'll be doing the book. Uh, so uh, Patreon's going to be like outside of my main work. It's been my my really big focus. Uh, we just finished up a Kickstarter for an art book called Life Studied, which is just a collection of my figure drawings. All the like uh, before the uh, COVID, we I used to go once a week to figure drawing classes just to try to stay sharp. Um, so I, I ended up amassing an enormous amount of figure drawings. Uh, we counted pages and we had about 400 pages of art that we could make a book with. Uh, I decided to make it a 200 page book just to keep from uh, just making a, just being a psycho and making a huge <laughs> collection giant, of figure drawings. Giant, yeah. huge. <laughs> but you know, like I ended up drawing so much throughout uh, the day that like there was no outlet for it. And so we talked about all these uh, uh, options we have now, and Patreon's a big one for me. I can take all those, all that sketching I do, and create this pipeline for fans to pick up. So that's the big one right now. Um, you know, and you we'll make be, them affordable, which is yeah, another. yeah. I've sort of based them on roughly like less. So the intro tier is less than a comic; it's three bucks, right. and you get literally like a post every day. Um, and like I said, the, the Q and a stuff and a process video. And then at the $10 level, you can ask questions for the Q and a stuff. Uh, you get the digital sign, you get discounts from our store. And then the, the highest one, um, every month I send you physical goods. So it's either, uh, like custom vinyl stickers that, that are a lot more expensive than you would think to make surprisingly. Um, yeah. uh, we're going to do art prints. And then at the end of each quarter, a sign, which is the thing that makes me the most excited because I just like the old school. I feel like I've come full circle and we're making these, you know, folded up, stapled little little art things that that fans can just, you know, dig on. And, and, and I don't know. I, I, I enjoy that kind of like low budget looking, mm -hmm. you know, art collections. It's like looking at someone's sketchbooks without any fancy polish to it you know you don't have to put it on your white gloves yeah exactly i just i dig that i like zines i think it's or zines however you want to pronounce it so that's that's the big one patreon.com slash mike hawthorne art uh mike what about your what's your insta and twitter feed? i think it's mike hawthorne art on all that and yeah, all i'm pretty them. sure yeah i try to keep it the same you know and DeviantArt, twitter instagram tumblr uh, even some of the Asian ones like Pixiv and mm. yeah, kind of all over the place. Just, just, uh, I, I figure you got to kind of share everywhere. Like we have this big opportunity to reach a lot of people. And early on, I sort of was resistant to social media and I realized that's just silly. Um, mm. you know, got to open up a little bit and, and it gave me a chance to like share. I could just post process sketches and all that stuff all the time. So and nobody will promote you more than you will promote you. Amen. Yeah, you find out real quick in this business that like the artists are very, very easily forgotten uh, if you don't constantly make noise. And I, I don't make a lot of noise, but I make a lot of stuff. So I just show it and share it nonstop. Now, are you manning this all yourself? Or are you getting any help? Or you yeah, because I'm crazy. Yeah, I'm pretty much doing it. Uh, I am lucky in that um, uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter, is uh, pretty proficient at Photoshop. So she's been uh, scanning a lot of the physical sketchbooks and putting together the digital and the print designs for me. And we go over it. I have final say, obviously. Um, and then my wife, who has more of a business background, sort of handles all the business stuff on the Kickstarter uh, uh, campaigns that we do. So she's you know, keeping track of ordering, shipping supplies, and what's the best kind of thing to use and the budget and all that stuff. Um, but you know, I'm still the one checking all the messages, responding to everybody. Um, I, I've always been kind of hyper, which is why I produce so much and, and it probably suits me to like be able to buzz around and like take a break. And I, I have, I have difficulty just chilling out and not working. So 
I can still like, like earlier, right before I got on with you guys, I had been working on, I finished the commission this morning then started layouts in the afternoon, took a break and packaged up all my gum road orders on my store and then came up here to talk to you guys. So, so, so how much of your day, do you break it up during the day? Like I do my Twitter in the morning and my Instagram at night. Like when are yeah. you doing your videos? Your uh, filming I, your videos. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't do a ton of, I actually haven't streamed in a little bit because I've been a little extra busy. Um, but I don't, I don't break up the day like that. I tend to go with like what needs done on those days. Uh, I will say that with Instagram, um, it's probably a good idea to post in the morning and in the evening. Uh, I have a lot of overseas fans, yeah, which I'm super grateful for. And they tend to support the Kickstarters. They're really uh, amazing folks. But um, if you post in the evening, you're kind of posting for them. Right. Uh, they get to see it at their, in their time zone. And in the morning, you, you know, uh, you're getting people on, on in the sort of US, UK world. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we have we had somebody in the chat who was uh, checking in from the Netherlands. She said yeah. it was 4 a.m. Right yeah, like now. that's amazing. I mean, to me, the overseas fans are, um, you know, it takes that much more dedication to decide, like, I care enough that I'm going to stay up to 4 in the morning to listen to this guy or, or look for his post or watch his live stream. Yeah. And um, I can't thank them enough. Like, to me, it's hard for me to believe that like people would want <laughs> to hear what I'm people saying. People want Mike Hawthorne 24 <laughs> seven. <laughs> it's a crazy thing. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I'm, and I'm super grateful and I'm always aware that like it could end tomorrow. So I'm going to try to make the best of it while I can. And, and the wolf stories at the door in Mike Hawthorne's house. It is. He's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You look outside, what do you see? You don't see trees and sky. You see that hungry ass wolf. It's all so, wolves. It's yeah. just wolves from, from sky to ground, dude. It's uh I think, yeah, I mean it's it's yeah, I, I should show you the sign on my door. I, I have uh here, I'm figuring you can see it. I don't know if you can read that. I have two signs on my door. Uh the one is the Latin phrase tarde venientibus osa, which means to the late comer goes the bones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the other one, my son made me because he realized how psychopathic the first mantra was that I that I I make myself uh, look at every time I enter the studio, and it's a, it's it's a quote from Bear in a Big Blue House. It says, "It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice." Yeah. And so those are basically the two philosophies that yeah, that kid is something else. Um, so it's it's this like be merciless to myself when it comes to the work, but be human to the folks that make the work possible and be kind to the people that make the work possible. Um, Cause you never know who you're talking to. You never know if like the person on the other end of the chat is having a crummy day and uh, you know, maybe that, that live stream picks up their day a little bit uh, or you responding to them saying something nice to you makes them like, you know, just gets them through the day. So we had a I, brief exchange, I think, about that on Twitter, because I think that a lot of artists feel that, uh, you know, I'm just drawing these stupid pictures and I'm not, you know, what does this mean? The world's melting down. But yeah. I think that if you can give somebody 30 seconds of joy when they read right. your comic or right. your drawing, yeah. You inspire people long term in ways that you cannot imagine. I mean, I you agree. know now you have people come up now and tell you, Oh, I'm doing this because of that. I yeah. I have people come up and tell me all the time. They remember stuff from when they were twelve years old and they were reading some comic right. that I did and it was like a big thing for yeah. them. So yeah, I I, I, I don't try to I used to feel uncomfortable about that, to be honest, in the beginning when people would say things like that. It would kind of like Yeah. But I realize now that if you can, your work goes out into the world and it's like a ping pong and it bounces off and it can affect people. And yeah. if you can make somebody happy for five minutes, maybe that's all that person needed today yeah. was just that five minutes to be happy. And it don't cost you nothing, you know, like it's, and there's the, the other side of that is like, you know, um, 
like my friends, my, my kids have these friends and they're old enough now to, you know, they follow me on Instagram. And one of them said something to one of my kids, like, why does your dad respond to everybody on Instagram? He's got a hundred thousand followers. Like he's a celebrity. Why does he respond? And I'm like, why it, that's preposterous. Like I'm a comic artist. I'm the furthest from an actual celebrity. Just cause you have a ton of followers. Doesn't mean you're like, yeah, you're anything. right. You're right. Tyler unfollow. <laughs> no, but I mean, there, there is yeah. a certain amount of that. Yeah. Where, like I started to realize people were grateful that you would thank them. You know, like they're, they're, they're stopping to say something nice to you. So it why feels, not say something nice? Yeah. Back? It feels like the most, human thing in the world to just say well thank you appreciate yeah. that like because yeah. most people don't do that because the the ego of celebrity means that you push out you don't pull in yeah right so you're here to put your shit out yeah or, yeah or as they say get your shit in and then yeah, you're, not, yeah. You're, you're not worried about actually treating people like human beings and that's yeah. kind of where yeah, i do the same thing i do try to people write I try to remember to always go back and say yeah. at least a little hand symbol. Thank you. Whatever. Yeah. yeah because yeah. it was done for me. Each of you guys have done it for me. Like, you know, Brett like said some nice stuff early on when on a message board. And I remember thinking, how's this possible? You know, Manly, you gave me early on some crits for some storyboards. I don't know if you remember the, the King with the chicken bone. It was a whole oh, sequence. Bro, 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 right. And uh, I remember thinking like, this guy's got Emmys and he's bothering to give me notes on my storyboard. Jamar, I, I can't even, to, it's 20 years of this guy telling me that I'm, I'm awesome and, and I ought to be king of the world and, and wait till the world finds out. Like, and you hear that from someone enough times you start to go like, yeah, maybe, maybe I am worth something. Uh, and so, yeah, if, if you, so many people have done it for me uh, over the years that I feel like while I can, now if I get a million followers tomorrow and I'm getting, you know, <laughs> inundated, maybe I, I don't respond to everybody, but I you'd try. Have your, you'd have to have your assistant give you the top, <laughs> the top, the top 100,000 to reply to. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's it. All right. All right, I'm going to cut the cord here. So okay, we, man. We, we had a great uh, evening talking with you, Mike. Uh, congratulations on all your past, future, and present successes. Well, thank you for having me, guys. I really, I love oh, you yeah. guys. You're, yeah. you're all art heroes love you. of mine. Me too. We love you. Right on. All right. all right, man. Have a great night. Say hi. And thanks for everybody for coming by, especially the lady from the Netherlands. Please get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, have a good night, Mike. All right, good night, guys. Good night. Um, it, like, this is my favorite part. I, I kicked them out. <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is my favorite part. Uh, real quick, we're going to wrap up. Thank you guys for hanging out with us for an uh, extended episode of Pencil to Pencil. That was really cool catching up with Mike. Um, that was like multiple extensions. <laughs> and now I just lost my uh, I, the thing keeps scrolling. Uh, our friend Emmanuel wanted to ask, and I'm sorry, I can't find his graphic. Um, are we going to do more uh, crit? Oh, here it is. Uh, sorry for one more question. Mike just reminded me, are you guys still going to be doing more portfolio review podcasts? Missed that last one because I had to hit deadlines. Sure. If if, if people send uh, the three JPEGs to the Mike at actionplanet.com, I'd be happy to, to do on, that. I got that John right there. There you go. Uh, if you send them, I'd be happy to go over uh, people's uh, work as always. Um, we had that offer is always standing. I guess we stopped talking about it because we had an initial rush of people doing it, and then people stopped. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they were too afraid. They they don't want to uh, attack the crit monster. <laughs> no. So. Um, <laughs> All right. So like I said, we, this was a really good episode. Just to let you guys know, uh, we're going to take Saturday off this week, um, but we'll be back on Wednesday with more guests. Uh, I don't have my sheet in front of me. Hold on. Oh, he threw himself into the negative zone. Uh oh, uh -oh. Well, looking at he's looking at his sheet uh, for well, well, he who we have coming up. 
in the next couple of weeks. Um, will, he, will he be back in a minute? Do you think? He he yeah, I'm sure he'll be back. Yeah, um, we're trying to firm up uh, another round of guests for I guess well until August at this point. What happened? I don't know. You went away. We missed you. Sorry about that. Welcome back, Jamar. Oh, okay. So what I was saying is uh, Art and Franco, uh, the Eisner Award-winning cartoons behind all of the tiny titans and the teeny things and all of those really fun uh, uh, Oh Yeah comics and their brand. Uh, and also the owners of three comic book shops uh, called Oh Yeah Comics across the, the, the nation are going to be our guests on uh, the Wednesday. Uh, Next the, the, the 22nd, Wednesday the 22nd. Uh, and we're going to take Saturday the 18th off, but we'll be back um, on the 22nd with Art Franco. Then uh, Saturday the 25th, we're going to have uh, Philadelphia's own Eric Battle on. So I'm always excited about what we're doing on the channel, and I think we're just growing in leaps and bounds. Sound good? <laughs> <laughs> and how? All right, you guys, I'm going to put this to bed. Thank you guys so much. Um, for my co-host, Brett and Mike, this is Jamar Nicholas signing off. Uh, we'll see you at the races. And remember to wash your hands. <laughs> have, a good, have a good night, guys. Good night.